What's up guys Chaos Shinobi here. This is what if Naruto has a celestial bloodline. Summary, Naruto develops a bloodline similar to the Byakugan. The Hyuga have no choice but to take him it. Chapter 1, you think you know about Uzumaki Naruto? Guess again. Oh, sure, he is the son of the Yondai Mei, and yeah, he is a ninja, but what else do you know about him? Let me tell you, his story is an epic. To start at his birth would leave a small portion of his story out of the light. But to do so would leave him shrouded in mystery. The only people who know why Kyubi no Kitsune attacked Kanahagakur are the Yondai Mei, who died in the battle, the Kyubi itself, and the gods. Contrary to popular belief, Kyubi was not killed by the Yondai Mei. It was far too powerful to die, as it was an immortal being. Also, it was entirely impossible to seal it, even with the Shinigami helping the human. But, the massive influx of power along with the destruction of its physical body allowed the Kyubi to achieve its dream to become a god, because these humans had helped it along the way, it left a passing gift for the child it was supposed to be sealed in. It had been impressed by the clan that called itself the Hyugas. Their bloodline limit was rather impressive, and they had managed to inflict a serious amount of damage to it, with a flick of its tail across the eyes of the crying child, she imparted a similar gift to him, along with the knowledge of what it did. How it would work, he would have to figure that out on his own. With that, the Kyubi no Kitsune ascended into paradise to join the gods who have come before it. It made a vow to watch over this child, knowing it would lead an interesting life. Ten years later, Uzumaki Naruto was in pain. It wasn't nearly as bad as the beating he got from the villagers, nor the ache of a whole day of training. It was a burning. His eyes felt like they were on fire. It was like that time he had gotten pink eye, only a year ago. The epidemic had swept through the children of Konoha. Although it wasn't incredibly serious, there were some worried about blindness if it had gone untreated. Fortunately for many children, the eye drops used as treatment for the disease was in no short supply. His eyes burned like that. He could dimly make out a blurred outline of his dresser as he sat up. From the amount of light filtering through his curtains, it was morning. Naruto stood up and attempted to walk, only to find that his legs wouldn't hold his weight. With a loud thunk he hit the floor, unable to move. There was a sudden flash of light, and Naruto saw. The only way to describe it would be like seeing the dust floating in the sunlight, only it was a lot more there, almost like a stream moving through the air. With a groan, he fell into blackness. Hey! Naruto felt a hand on his shoulder. Come on, sleepy head, wake up! With a start, Naruto jumped up, scooting backwards and away from the person who had touched him. It was a reflexive action from the repeated beatings he had received. Whoa, slow down there. I'm not gonna hurt you. Naruto looked at his attacker. The loose clothing hid any definite physical features of this person. He couldn't figure out if it was a man or a woman. Its face was beautiful, but not definitely male or female. The robes were asexual as well, with the colors neutral. However, the blood-red eyes that looked at him were very scary. Who? Who are you? That's not important right now. I have to explain something to you. Where am I? The person sighed. You are in a dream. Now shut up and listen. Naruto instantly shut his open mouth. Good. Okay. You remember your history class, right? Naruto nodded. Good. You know that the Yondame defeated the Kyubi no Kitsune, right? Again, Naruto nodded. You were lied to. The shocked look on Naruto's face was priceless. What? What do you mean, the Yondame attempted to seal it into a human child? You were that child. However, he failed, and the Kyubi ascended. That's why the villagers hated you, because they believed that you were the Kyubi, or that Kyubi had taken over your body. But, that's not true. I dare say, it will be a cold day in hell when a human gets the best of a demon lord. Naruto laughed at a metal picture of frozen flames. But, Kyubi was impressed by their efforts. It gave you a gift. You now possess a bloodline limit that far surpasses all others. However, it is both a blessing and a curse. If you accept it, you will have the ability to see and manipulate energy. What you know is chakra. This means, not only will you be able to mold your enemy's chakra, but also the chakra of any living creature you can see. Unfortunately, this means that you must give up the ability to produce chakra in your body. This means that you will have to live off of other people's chakra, but you will have a near infinite supply from the creatures around you. Now, you can choose now, accept this gift, or continue life without it. Naruto was dumbfounded. He had a choice? Few people ever gave him that luxury, even over inconsequential matters. But, here he sat, choosing between a bloodline limit and a normal life. Well, as normal as he could have. Sure, he was shocked that he was supposed to have been the container of the Kyubi no Kitsune, but. Somehow, it made sense, 
so he just accepted it. After a minute or so of waiting the pros, and the cons, Naruto come to a decision. I, I've always wondered what it would be like to have a bloodline limit. I accept it. The person smiled and made a gesture. Naruto didn't know what that gesture meant, but apparently it made his eyes tingle. There you go, all set. Now, you have one week to learn a chakra transfer jutsu before your body stops making chakra. Oh, and before you wake up, be sure to tell that old Kajra the Sun Daimate to check the seal. He'll find it empty. Now, it's time to wake up. The world around him slowly faded. The person's voice slowly faded from a wake up. Wake up. Wake up. To an ENT and ENT and ENT of Naruto's alarm clock. Groggily, he sat up and looked around. He pressed the button to shut off the alarm and stood up. His neck ached from the strange position he had fallen asleep in. The floor was definitely not comfortable. Naruto was definitely not a morning person. He was so tired he didn't notice the yellowish streams that floated in the air. Nor did he notice that the burning in his eyes that had been plaguing him for the past three days was mysteriously gone. He sluggishly made his way to his bathroom, where he stripped and stepped into the water. Forgetting that it wasn't instantly hot, he was immediately awake from the icy stream that hit him full in the face. After finishing his shower, he made his way back to his room, where he found some clean boxers and an orange jumpsuit that didn't have too many ramen stains on it. Before he left, he went to his mirror. Usually in the mornings, he would give his reflection a lecture on being strong and how he was going to become Hokage, but today he just stared. His usually shockingly blue eyes were different. They had faded to a pale blue that seemed almost white. All traces of a pupil had disappeared. Needless to say Naruto was shocked. So, he did what came to his mind first. He screamed. And screamed. And screamed. He took a deep breath and started running down the street towards the Hokage Tower still screaming at the top of his lungs. Sundaime Hokage was just sitting down to a nice cup of coffee before the morning paperwork, when the doors to his office burst open. A screaming Naruto ran into the room. Jis and Mii is hurt and now they're blue and scary and Kyuubi is and Seelet and Myon did not know what or don't please help. Whoa, slow down, Naruto. Naruto hiccuped once and quieted down. In the excitement, Sundaime had spilled the coffee down his front and on several very important documents. Today isn't starting out well. Okay, Naruto, explain to me what happened. Naruto hiccuped again and started talking. He told Sandaime about how his eyes burned, about falling out of bed, about the dream, and about his new bloodline limit, and that he was supposed to tell him about the seal. Sandaime's face cycled through several emotions before he sat back and pinched the bridge of his nose. He could feel the headache coming on already. Naruto come over here. Naruto walked around the desk and tried his hardest not to laugh at the brown stains on the front of the Hokage's white robes. Naruto, can I see the seal, please? Naruto looked confused for a moment before Sandaime pointed at Naruto's navel. With a nod, Naruto lifted up his shirt. The Sandaime went into a minor trance and let some chakra enter the seal. With a start, he realized that the seal, although full of chakra, was devoid of any and all consciousness. The chakra contained in the seal had been gleaned off the boy's own for years, which was the reasoning behind Naruto's incredible chakra levels. Naruto put his shirt down after Sandaime leaned back in his chair. So, Kyuubi was never sealed inside you. You're a lucky child. Naruto grinned his trademark grin while scratching the back of his head. However, Sandaime continued, I will have to have someone train you on how to use those eyes of yours. You said that it was inspired by the Byakugan and that it has much of the same effects, such as seeing chakra? Naruto nodded. Hmm. What better person to train you than the owners of the original? The Sundaime snapped once, and a single onbu materialized out of nowhere. I need you to bring Hyuga Hyashi here. Tell him it's urgent, and it involves the secrets of the Byakugan. That should do the trick, but if it doesn't, tell him it's a direct order for me, and, if ignored will be treated as treason. The Anbu nodded and melded into the background. Naruto was bored. He sat on one of the chairs in front of the Hokage's desk, wishing this Hyuga Hyashi person would show up. The minutes passed. Finally, as Naruto was about to pull a prank he'd been thinking of, the doors to the Hokage's office burst open. An enraged Hyuga stormed in, babbling on and on almost incoherently. Naruto could only stare at the fury of the verbal barrage. The Hokage just sat there, smoking his pipe. Finally, the man shut up. Finished? Hi, Hokage-sama. Good. Now, it has come to my attention that a new bloodline limit has surfaced. Its effects appear to be eerily similar to that of the Byakugan. Due to the fact that many would kill to get their hands on the Byakugan itself, I'm sure they wouldn't stop at just taking its cousin. So, I have a request that is in your clan's favor. And that would be, 
Hokage-sama, take the wielder of this new bloodline and teach him. Make him a part of the clan if you have to, but train him and keep him safe. And who would this person be? Sundaime pointed, and Hyashi turned to face Naruto. The demon brat? Is this some sort of joke? It was then that he noticed the boy's eyes. They looked exactly like the Byakugan, except for the coloring. The Byakugan was actually a slight shade of violet, an extremely pale lavender. This boy's eyes had the same degree of paleness, only it was blue. Needless to say, he was stunned. A near replica of the Byakugan in the head of the most hated person in the village? He could only shudder at the repercussions against his clan's honor if they accepted him. But they must, if only to keep its secrets. Naruto looked on in amusement as the strange man's face turned several different colors before fading back to normal. Hyashi turned to Sandaime and spoke. I will take him in. But I have one condition. Sundaime raised an eyebrow before saying and that is, you publicly acknowledge the child is a human and dispel any and all rumors of him being a... being a monster. Oh, that shouldn't be a problem. He never had QB sealed inside him anyway. Hyashi paled, thinking that the Sundaime had just broken his own law and revealed the existence of QB to the child. Then, his ears caught up with his mind, and he heard the last part. What do you mean, QB was never sealed inside the boy? I saw the seal myself. I know it's there. Apparently, QB was too powerful to be sealed, and when his soul was ripped from his body, the influx of Yondaime's chakra caused it to transcend. In other words, it became a god. Hyashi paled again. If QB had been powerful before, he shuddered. It appears that QB left a gift for Naruto when it left. Those eyes of his were it. Naruto told me that it spoke to him, and told him it was impressed with the Byakugan, and used it as a model for Naruto's own bloodline. That is quite some praise coming from a former demon lord and a lesser god. Hyashi smiled at the thought. Before he could let his mind wander, he jerked himself back to reality. I see. I'll see to it that the boy's belongings are fetched from his apartment. Is there anything else you need, Hokage-sama? No, Hyashi, that is all. It appears that I am indebted to you. Should you need a favor, ask me, and I will do my best within the limits of my powers to see it accomplished. Sundaime grimaced at the horrible amount of political power he just placed in the hands of an already powerful clan head. But for Naruto, it was worth it. Then I shall be on my way. Hyashi turned to a now nervous Naruto. Come, child. I'll show you to your new house. And with that, Naruto found himself thrust into a new life with its own difficulties and advantages. Despite the drawbacks, it was better than what he had before and he was content. Chapter 2 Hyashi looked at the peaceful face of the sleeping child. It had been a long day for the boy. First, he woke up with different eyes, and then he was told he would be moving from his home and he would be living with complete strangers. On top of that, he had walked for nearly three hours on a tour of the Hyuga complex. Now, if all this torture wasn't enough, they threw out his orange jumpsuit and forced him to stand stock still for half an hour while they put this thing up next to him, apparently measuring his every proportion. Finally. They gave him a white t-shirt and a pair of off-white, almost cream-colored shorts, and escorted him to his room. Being tuckered out from this day's adventures, he instantly fell asleep. From what the Sundaime has told me, this child has led a tough life. It's rather obvious in his rambunctious behavior and poor. No, his non-existent manners. However, as he will be living with us, he must learn manners so as not to bring shame on the Hyuga name. He has a long road ahead of him. I wish him luck. Excuse me. Hyashi-sama. Hyashi turned to look at the branch family member who was bowing politely to him. Yes? The council requests your presence immediately. Hyashi nodded and started walking away. He stopped and turned back to the branch family member. Watch the boy until nightfall. If he wakes, take him wherever he needs to go. And if he's hungry, take him to the kitchens and tell the cooks that he has my permission to have whatever he wants. Yes, Hyashi-sama. With that, Hyashi turned and continued his walking. Before he knew it, he was brooding. He wasn't even paying attention to where his feet were taking him. Before long, he found himself in front of the council chambers. With a sigh, he reached out and opened the door. Walking inside, he bowed politely to the assembled elders. After the formalities were out of the way, one of the council members spoke up. I am aware that one Uzumaki Naruto has been offered living quarters under your orders. Is this true? Yes, it is. Would you care to explain to us why the demon child is living in the Hyuga compound? Are you aware that his presence here mars the Hyuga name? Yes, I am aware of that. However, I have been informed by the Hokage-sama that the Kyubi no Kitsune was never sealed inside the child. This has been confirmed by the Hokage-sama himself. Also, it appears that a bloodline limit has awoken in the child. Its appearance and its effects are eerily similar to that of the Byakugan, 
and it is believed to hold the same secrets. Therefore, in order to keep the secrets of the Hyuga secret, I have requested guardianship of the boy. One council member, who distinctly resembled a rat, buck teeth and everything, spoke up. You are aware that it is impossible to acquire guardianship over the boy. The son Daime Hokage-sama had long ago emancipated the boy, giving him full citizenship and giving him full rights and privileges of an adult. Yes, I am aware of that. But, in order to keep the Byakugan exclusively in the Hyuga family, I wish, with the council's permission, to betroth my eldest daughter, Hayuga Hinata to Uzumaki Naruto. If the council members were surprised, they didn't show it. A vote was taken. In the Hayuga council, votes are taken using beads. A white bead is a vote in favor of the subject, while a black bead is a vote against it. A bowl with two sections is passed around the table, and each member deposits a bead in its respective sides. Whites on one side, blacks on the other. When the bowl reaches the council leader, he counts the beads and then proclaims the results of the vote. Just like he was doing now. 25 votes in favor, 25 votes against the proposition. In the event of a tie, it is required that the council leader break the tie. His choice would change the future of the small boy who lay peacefully sleeping in his room, oblivious to the power this man held. The man held a clenched fist over the bull. Everyone in the room waited, breath held. The man's hand slowly opened, and the bead he held in his hand dropped. It seemed to hang in midair just long enough for everyone to catch what color it was. The white bead landed amongst its fellow white-colored markers with a small clank. Hyashi let out the breath he had been unconsciously holding. He smiled to himself, knowing that the secrets of the Byakugan were safe. The council leader stood. The vote has been passed, the deed is done. From this day on, Uzumaki Naruto will be known as Hayuga Naruto. He shall be given the status and privileges of a main branch member. Starting tomorrow, he is to be taught etiquette, poise, and the Jukan fighting style. He is to be refined into an honorable and polite main branch member. Anything short of perfection will be frowned upon. The council leader struck a small gong. This meeting is adjourned. Hyashi smiled and thanked the council. Tomorrow would be a long day. Hayuga Naruto slept peacefully, unaware of what was to come. To say that Naruto slept well would be a massive understatement. It might have been the feather soft bed he slept in, or the memory foam pillows. It could have been the silk sheets, or the goose down blankets. It could have been that the sun wasn't shining through rips and tears in his curtain. No, it was that, for the first time in his life, Naruto felt safe. He no longer felt in danger of the villagers breaking into his house in the middle of the night and kidnap him, dragging him away to be tortured. With a yawn and a stretch, Naruto came fully awake. Just as he sat up, there was a small tapping on the door to his new room. Excuse the intrusion, Naruto-sama, but I have been requested to wake you. Naruto-sama? No one has ever called me that before. The door slid open, and an 11-year-old boy stepped into the room. He wore the typical white or cream-colored jacket that all Hyuga seemed to wear, along with black shorts. His right leg was bandaged down past his knee. He had black sandals. His hair was tied into a very loose ponytail. As he was a Hyuga, he had the supremely pale lavender eyes, but the coldness in them made Naruto cringe. My name is Hyuga Niji. I have been instructed by Hiroshi-sama to present you with two things. A letter and a new set of cloths. The boy held out a brown parcel in one hand and a scroll in the other. Naruto jumped out of bed and ran over to grab them with a small thanks, Neji-san. Naruto ripped open the package haphazardly. He pulled out the cloths and hurriedly got dressed. When he finished, he looked at himself in the mirror. Naruto did a double take at the image he saw looking back at him. It was like he was a different person. He wore black sandals with a small white Hyuga insignia on the side. His black pants were neither too tight nor too loose. He had a small section of white bandages underneath his kunai and shuriken holsters. The black shirt he wore was, much like his pants, neither too loose nor too tight. A small amount of fishnet could be seen around the loose collar and the short sleeves. He slipped on the pale creme colored jacket. The design was exactly like his old orange and blue, only instead of red swirls, there was the Hyuga insignia, the burning flames. The majority of the jacket that had been orange before was now a pale creme while the parts that had been blue were now a grayish color. His new outfit combined with his new eyes definitely made him look like a Hyuga. The only thing out of place was his shockingly bright blonde hair. Neji just stood there, looking at him impassively. Life really wasn't fair. This child was proclaimed to be an idiot and a demon, and now was a main branch member when the prodigy of the Hyuga was a branch family member? The coldness once again took his eyes. When Naruto finally finished ogling at himself, Neji spoke up. Hyashi-sama had told me to tell you that you were not to attend the academy for the next week. You will be learning etiquette here for that time. After you have reached an acceptable level, 
you will once again attend the academy. After your days at the academy, you will return here to learn the Jukan style. In the meantime, before I escort you to your lessons, you are to read the letter. Naruto looked up in confusion, before spotting the scroll. He cracked the seal and read it. Dear Naruto, welcome to the Hyuga family. From this day onwards, your name is no longer Uzumaki Naruto, but will be Hyuga Naruto. You have been accepted into the Hyuga family as a main branch member. As such, you will act with the honor and courtesy required by your social status. As a Hyuga, you will be taught etiquette, manners, proper speech, and the basics of politics. Also, you will be instructed in the ways of the Jukin. You will continue your courses at the Ninja Academy after you have reached an acceptable level of poise. You are to dress and act with dignity at all times. You are to conduct yourself as a Hyuga should. Any breaches of conduct will be dealt with severely. However, you will be granted an allowance of 10,000 Ryo, and I'm making one Ryo equivalent to one yen, which is roughly equivalent to an American penny, per month. You will receive your first allowance after you complete your etiquette course. Again, I welcome you to the Hyuga family, and I hope you will enjoy your new life. Hyuga Hiyashi. Come, Naruto-sama. It would not do if you were late to your first lesson. Naruto looked up. He was trying to digest all this information. Thanks to how hectic yesterday was, he was more than accepting of this news. So, with a grin, he followed Neji to his first lessons. Chapter 3 Naruto Naruto Naruto-sama, pay attention. Naruto continued to stare into space. Man, this is boring he though. A ruler slapped his wrist and Naruto was brought back into the real world. Naruto mumbled a string of rather strong curses under his breath, thinking his instructor wouldn't hear. He was wrong. Of course, his reward was another slap on the wrist. It still hurt nonetheless. Naruto-sama, if you want to continue living in the Hyuga manner, you must pay attention. Naruto nodded, and after a few minutes diligence, started staring off into space again. The branch member sighed. I think it's time for a pop quiz. This brought Naruto back into reality. Neji-san, could you ask Hinata-sama if she would join us? Neji nodded and walked over to a slightly open door and slid it open to reveal the Hyuga heiress, red in the face watching the lessons. N. N. Neji N. Nisan H. How are Y. You. Hinata-sama Neji's voice was as cold as ice. Would you join us please? H. Hi. The shy girl stood up and walked over to Naruto and his instructor. Her posture was rather bad for the heiress of the strongest clan in Kanahaga Kaur. Her shoulders were slumped and she bent her back just a little bit in a slouch. Her movements were rather awkward, as she was just entering a growth spurt and was not used to the length of her limbs. She flashed a small, shy smile at the blonde boy. Her face was tinged a very noticeable pink, contrasting with her pale, creamy skin. No one knew that Hinata already knew Naruto. She had watched him during their time at the academy. She could name every prank he had ever pulled, as well as all the victims, whether it was a person or an object. Her hands instinctively came up to her chest, and her index fingers started pushing against each other, seemingly portraying her confidence fighting her shyness. Her shyness won every time. H. Hello, Naruto-san. The instructor spoke up. Now, Naruto-san, you must introduce yourself. And be sure to do it as I taught you. Kanichi wa. Boku no namai wa yu, Hayuga Naruto desu. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Kanichi wa, Naruto-san. Watashi no namai wa Hayuga Hinata desu. It's a pleasure to meet you. I hope we may get along well. Naruto smiled and turned to his instructor. You did well, Naruto-san. Remember. When speaking to people of your own standing, use either Sama, if you respect them, or San if you are unsure. You may only use Kun or Chan after you know them well. And it is considered very impolite to call someone Ba Chan or Ji Chan, never do so unless you have known them for years and you are on very good terms with them. Now, you may go play with Hinata Sama for the rest of the day, if you see fit. Tomorrow, we will start table manners. Until then, Naruto Sama. With that, the branch family member stood and left. Neji was left to watch over the two. Ano, Naruto-san. Do. Do you wa, want a G, go P, P, play in the G, gardens? Sure Hinata-cha. Uh. I mean Hinata-san. Naruto stood up and grabbed her hand, dragging her behind him as he ran off in a random direction. After a moment, he stopped and looked back at the furiously blushing Hinata. Ano, which way are the gardens? Hinata blushed and giggled a little. T, take I L, left. Here, I... I'll show you. Naruto thanked the girl as she started walking at a rather brisk pace. They soon reached the gardens. The gardens were beyond beautiful. Naruto had never seen anything like them. The grass was cut a uniform length, 
and was completely even in thickness through the entire place. There was a small pond shaped like a dumbbell, two main pools connected by a channel. A small red bridge stood over the channel. Off to one side, there was a small shrine in the traditional Shinto style. Along the gravel paths that wandered through the immense flower beds were a myriad of stone statues. Some looked to be carved out of stone, other wood, and a few looked to be metal. There were even some that appeared to be solid gold. Near one side of the pond, a pile of stones had a small spring at the top. The water cascaded down the stones, creating an extremely relaxing trickling noise distantly similar to rainfall. Hinata giggled as she watched her crush. He was standing as he had been taught. His back was straight and his shoulders were back. His chest was thrust out slightly, but not so much as to appear arrogant. His posture conflicted greatly with his expression. Naruto wore his amazement like a banner that said wow. Hinata was again pushing her fingers against each other. She was again having a mental battle. However, for the first time ever, her confidence won out, albeit barely. She reached out and grabbed his hand, leading him through the flower beds. As she talked, her stutter gradually lessened, and had almost disappeared by the time they had reached the shrine at the end of the path. Hyashi sat in front of the shrine. He had lit some incense for his deceased brother's soul, much as he did every day. He still blamed himself for his brother's death, and Neji's cold demeanor. He was meditating as he usually did at this time of the day, when he heard voices. It was Naruto along with someone he didn't recognize. The voice sounded eerily similar to his daughter's, but it couldn't be hers. He not always stuttered horribly, and this girl showed almost no sign of such an impediment. Finally, the voices stopped, as their owners had rounded the bend to see Hyashi sitting there in the lotus position. Think Indian style. With a small EP Nata stopped in the middle of her sentence. Naruto grinned at the thought of being able to impress Hyashi-sama with his newly learned manners. Kanichi wa Hyashi-sama. Genki desu ka? Genki desu, Naruto-san. It is good to see you have learned manners. I commend you in learning them to a decent level on your first day. Hyashi opened his eyes and turned around. He was surprised that it was Hinata that had been with Naruto. The only surprise he showed was a raised eyebrow, and that was only for a moment. Hello. Hinata-chan. Are you doing well? Y, yes, F, father, I A, am doing W, well. And Y, you, I am well. I was so pleased that you had been speaking without stuttering for quite some time. Perhaps you should speak with Naruto-san more often? Perhaps he can help you get rid of it permanently? Yes, F, father. Perhaps you should spend the time between the end of your day at the academy and your training sessions in the evenings with him. It would be a great chance to get to know him as well as to practice how to speak without stuttering. Naruto and Hinata aren't going to learn that they're engaged until they're 12 or 13 or something like that. In the meantime Hiroshi continued I believe it's time for you to get ready for your training session. After a few seconds of silence, as Naruto had finally learned not to speak unless he had something to say, Hinata said Ono, oh F, Father, perhaps Naruto-san could A, accompany me to my T, training. Perhaps now would be a G, good time for him to L, Learn the basics of Juken? Hyashi looked genuine surprise. Hinata actually asked for something? She rarely did that, and with the fact that she wasn't stuttering as much as she usually does when she asks for stuff, Hyashi was now very glad he had taken in Naruto. He could already see the confidence growing in his little girl. Very well, Hinata. It is a good idea, provided Naruto can actually see the chakra holes. I will be attending a council meeting tonight, so I will not be able to train you. Tell your instructor to test Naruto. Now, I believe you need to find your training outfit. He nodded nodded. After a quick bow, which Naruto copied, she ran off to her rooms. Naruto was hot on her heels. Fortunately for the shy girl, Naruto had enough sense to stop outside of her room instead of barging in like he would have done two days ago. After he nodded changed, they ran off to one of the Hyuga training grounds. Soon, things became a routine for Naruto and Hinata. Their skills grew, along with Hinata's confidence. After Naruto completed his crash course in Manners 101, his mornings consisted of a stretch and a few laps around a training field. After that, he would shower, and meet Hinata and some of the other young Hyuga, including Neji, for a breakfast. Afterwards, Hinata, Naruto, and Neji left for the academy together. With Hinata's confidence growing, and Naruto finally getting quality instruction, they both grew into fine ninja trainees. Hinata was no longer considered weak and her fighting was up to par with Hiroshi's expectations. Naruto grew extremely fast, and it became obvious he was a natural at Jiken. His skills rivaled Neji's, and the three young ninja together could give Hiroshi quite a workout in their sparring. Before long, the days turned into weeks, the weeks into months, and the months into years. 
Two years later, it was time for the Genin exams. A groggy Nardo rolled over in bed. He looked at the alarm clock sitting on the bedside table. It read 5.46 a.m. Naruto had woken up to thunder in the distance. As thunderstorms were rare in Konoha, all the light sleepers in the village were awake, Naruto included. To make matters worse, today was the team selection day. Naruto and Hinata had both aced the Janan exams, so were ready to be placed on a three-man Janan team. Today was the day they would be selected. Naruto could only hope he would be on a team with Hinata. Naruto groaned and got out of bed. He threw on his cloths and went to meditate in the main gardens. It was the same ones Hinata had shown him two years ago. Hinata. For some reason, whenever Naruto thought about her, he felt a tightness in his chest. He didn't know what it was, but he knew that he liked her. She was his best friend. He had other friends, sure, but she was his first. The others at the academy had grown to be a lot nicer to him, but that was mostly due to the fact that the Sun Daime had publicly announced the destruction of the QB the fact it wasn't sealed inside Naruto, and also Naruto's legacy. The populace of Konoha was rather shocked that their scapegoat that they had treated like dirt for the first ten years of his life was the son of their hero. That fact, coupled with the fact that he was now officially a Hyuga, Naruto was now very popular. Many people felt bad for how they had treated him, and many had asked for forgiveness. Naruto gladly gave it to them. It appeared that Naruto became just as popular as Uchiha Sasuke and even had a following of his own. Recently, it appeared that the two clubs had combined into the Hyuga Naruto and Uchiha Sasuke fan club. Now, both of the boys had their own share of rabid fan girls, although he not a subtle glares and whispered threats kept them off of Naruto. At least when she was around. Naruto was snapped out of his mental ranting by light footsteps behind him. Two silky smooth hands covered his already closed eyes, and a voice that made his heart skip a beat said guess who. Naruto instantly burst into a huge foxy grin. Hinata-chan, I know it's you. A fit of giggling met his ears. You're perceptive this morning, Naruto-kun. Hinata grabbed his arm and pulled him up. Come on, let's go get some breakfast. After a rather refreshing breakfast and a shower afterwards, Naruto met up with Hinata at the front gates. Neji had already left to meet up with his team. Naruto still doesn't know how the green spandex could allow that Jounin to sprout a clone. But he decided not to think about it too hard. The green spandex seemed to be a living thing. As did those things that sat over their eyebrows. You ready to go? He nodded nodded, and the pair took off to the academy. After dodging several groups of fangirls, accidentally knocking Sasuke from his tree into their waiting arms, and sprinting the last 100 yards to the academy entrance, they made their way to their homeroom. After a few minutes, Iruka-sensei entered the classroom. Okay, as you all are aware, today is the team selection day. Usually, the teams are selected by grade, taking the highest scoring students the lowest scoring students, and someone from the middle to be on a team to balance it out. However, the Hokage-sama handpicked the teams this year. Team 1 At this point, Naruto and Hinata were chatting in whispers in the back of the class. Sasuke was brooding, but Naruto and Hinata were trying to suppress laughter at the obvious signs of lipstick all over his face. Apparently, the girls had gotten the best of him today. 7 Hyuga Naruto, Hyuga Hinata, and Akimichi Kuji, I repeat, Team 7, Hyuga Naruto, Hyuga Hinata, and Akimichi Kuji. Your sensei is Morino Iviki. Team 8, Haruno Sakura, Uchiha Sasuke, and Yamanaka Ino. Your sensei is Saru Tobiasuma. Team 9, Narashikamaru, Inuzu Kakiba, and Abra Meshino. Your sensei is Yuhikura Night. Team 10, Naruto and Hinata looked at each other and grinned. They were on a team together. And that concludes the team placement. You're now free to eat lunch and I suggest you use this time to get to know your teammates. You're dismissed. Naruto and Hinata happily chatted with each other until they found their teammate. Naruto was the first to introduce himself. Hi. I'm Hayuga Naruto. Nice to meet you. Kuji looked up. He had been devastated that he wasn't on the same team with Shikamaru, and even more so that he had been put with two of the most important people his age in Konoha. Hayuga Naruto was the son of the Yondaimei, and had a yet unnamed bloodline and Hyuga Hinata was the heir to the Hyuga clan, and one of the most eligible bachelorette in Konoha. How could he even keep up with these two? They were two of the best in the class, and he was at the bottom. Hello. I'm Akimichi Kuji. Nice, to meet, you. You're an Akimichi, aren't you? I'm Hyuga Hinata, and it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm glad you're on our team. That meat tank is a really powerful jutsu, and I can't wait to see it in action. Yeah, me either. Kuji couldn't believe his ears. 
one of the strongest academy students and heir to the Hyuga clan had just complimented him? And on top of that, the son of the Yondaime was agreeing with her? Kuji looked at the sky, expecting it to drop at any moment. Smiling, Kuji felt that somehow, it wouldn't be as bad as he thought. Chapter 4 Morino Iviki was exited. Almost as exited as when he has a few new POWs to interrogate. Finally, I get to see if my theory is correct. It's gonna be hard for these Jinan, and if they come out of this sane, they'll be the strongest of the rookies. He chuckled at the thought. Sure, he would have to mentally and emotionally torture them to mold them into both a weapon and a human at the same time. Able to kill without emotion, but also able to have a social life and retain their sanity. This would be fun, but he would have to tread carefully. Iviki found himself outside the academy. Time to pick up my victims. Uh. I mean my team. He made his way to where they were waiting. A small amount of chatter came floating through the slightly open door. Iviki jerked open the door. The slam it made as it stopped its sliding made the entire room jump. Team 7, Naruto, Hinata, and Kuji had been chatting quietly when the door slammed open. A rather intimidating man stood there. The high collar of the black trench coat rang the man's neck, coming up almost to his ears. He had two parallel scars running diagonally down his face. Underneath his trench coat, he had a deep navy blue button-up shirt with its own collar hiding the man's neck. He wore his forehead protector like a bandana, covering the man's head completely, no hair showing. He wore nondescript black pants, and if he wore any shuriken or kunai holsters, it was hidden by his trench coat. His black combat boots replaced the usual sandals that most shinobi wore. The three on Team 7 jumped up and followed the intimidating man as he left. Not a word was spoken as they traveled to one of the training grounds. When they reached it, he stopped and turned to face them. My name, as you already know, is Morino Iviki. I was the head interrogator of the Anbu lead ops up until a few days ago, where I transferred my position to my apprentice, Mitarash Yanko. I did so because I wanted to train a Jinan team. You three will be part of a six-week specialized training program. Now, introduce yourselves, and tell me your likes, dislikes, hobbies, and dreams. Naruto nodded and spoke first my name is Hayuga Naruto. I like ramen, training, and my close friends. I dislike people who judge before getting to know people. My hobbies are training and practicing using my bloodline limit and finding out new things about it and its abilities. My dreams. Never really thought about it. But I guess it would be to become as strong as I can to hold up the Hyuga name and to protect my friends. Iviki nodded. Next, Yuhi pointed at Kuji. Kuji stepped forwards. My name is Akimichi Kuji. My likes are food and my friends. My dislikes are people who call me. Weight challenged. My hobbies are eating new foods, and my dreams are to become a strong ninja and a respected restaurant critic. Your turn Iviki says, pointing at Hinata. The shy girl looked down a little bit. She started playing with her fingers but stopped with a look from Naruto. My name is Hayuga Hinata. My likes are training with Naruto-kun and learning new things. My dislikes are people who are mean for no reason. My hobbies are training with Naruto-kun and making medicinal ointments. My dreams for the future. The girl stopped there and blushed a deep crimson while staring at the ground. Good. Now, you can forget about all of that. The three Jinan looked up at the man as if he had sprouted an extra head. Starting tomorrow at 0600, you are to report here every day. From now on, you do not have names. You are Team 7. You will be called Alpha he points at Naruto. You will be Beta he points at Hinata and you will be Charlie. His voice was harsh, loud, and crisp. Imagine a drill sergeant from any army movie, and you get the general idea of what he sounds like. From now on, you are not human. You are maggots. Impress me, and you will move up to dirt. Should you manage to make me believe you are worthy of becoming a Konoha Shinobi, only then will you become human. You are not to sit, speak, think, breath, or even shit without my permission. You will address me as Sir or Sensei, as you see fit. Do you understand me? The three could only nod. When I ask you a question, you will respond either Sir, yes sir or Sir, no sir. Do you understand me? Sir, yes sir. I can't hear you. Sir, yes sir. Not half bad. For maggots. Be here at 0600 tomorrow morning. If you are late, you will run laps around Konoha until I say stop. Understood, sir, yes sir, good. Dismissed. Right when the three finally though they were free, Iviki turned to them. Enjoy yourselves tonight. It will be the last chance you have in a long time. With that, the three took off running, genuinely scared of the man. Naruto was in hell. Only a week had passed since they had started training. When they got to the training grounds in the morning, they were told to run 25 laps around Konoha. When they were done, they did exercises like push-ups, 
sit-ups, jumping jacks, and a myriad of other strength training exercises. When they finished that, they were forced to run through a mile-long obstacle course which involved them dodging kunai and shuriken, crawling under and over barbed wire fences, forced to go through mud on their bellies, climbing ropes and ladders, and jumping down a 30-foot cliff before climbing back up and doing it again. On top of that, if they didn't finish the obstacle course in less than three minutes, they had to repeat the entire process, laps around Konoha and everything. On top of that, each time they failed, Iviki put a jutsu over them that made a miniature storm cloud follow each recruit, constantly raining on them. Needless to say, they were miserable. Iviki was a harsh sensei. He constantly yelled at them, throwing every single insult he could muster at them. If and when they retaliated, they were swiftly beaten and thrown to the ground. Then, because they rebelled, they started their regimen over from the start. It was brutal. It had been going on for a week straight, and by the time they finished at sundown, they were too tired to do anything but run home, shower, and go to sleep. However, at the moment, they were crawling through the mud under a series of barbed wire fences, and were forced to stay down, lest one of the myriad of kunai and shuriken that were flying overhead hit them. And to make it worse, Iviki was throwing insults at them. You call yourself a shinobi. You're nothing but a tub of lard. I should have you split open and use your fat to butter my rolls. You are a disgrace to humanity. He leaned closer. Give up now, it'll make life so much easier on you. Poor Kwuji could only keep on crawling, oblivious to the tears that were streaming down his already mud-stained face. Iviki turned to Hinata, leaving Kwuji to crawl out of the pit and run to the rope ladder and try to climb up. You are weak, aren't you, maggot? Answer me, sir, yes sir. Hinata's voice was barely audible. I can't hear you. Sir, yes sir. That's better. Get your ass in gear and get out of my sight. Maggot. Hinata started crawling faster in an attempt to get away from their instructor. He followed her progress through the course, and they finally reached the end. You maggots did better today, but you still didn't beat three minutes. Start your laps. Naruto groaned under his breath, fed up with the torture. Iviki heard him, instantly rounding on the boy. Did I just hear you complaining? Sir, no sir. I can't hear you. Sir, no sir. Bullshit. Tell me what you think of your training. Sir, I love it sir. I only wish the other graduates could enjoy IT as I do, sir. Well, maggot, since you enjoy it so much, you can double all your exercises. That goes for your teammates too. Now get your asses in gear, maggots. The three trainees started running, internally grimacing at the 50 laps around Konoha they were facing. Not even training under Hiroshi-sama was this bad. Naruto thought. Flashback. Naruto stood in front of the Hayuga, cringing in fear. The man was glaring at the boy. Naruto was seemingly useless. He was clumsy, moved extremely slow, and couldn't seem to get even the basic stances right. You're worthless. I want you to go through all the kata I showed you until you can get them right, and at the same speed I showed you. Until then, you will not leave the training grounds. Naruto grimaced and started the most basic poses, gradually shifting through each strike and block before continuing to the next. Hyashi just stood there, watching the boy and striking each offending arm or leg that was out of position with his cane. Around dusk, Hyashi left. The next morning, Hyashi woke early and went to Naruto's room, expecting to have to drag the boy out of his bed. To his surprise, the bed hadn't been slept in. He went to the training grounds to see Naruto still there, running through each kata and stance. Hyashi was rather surprised to see the boy still there and awake, but even more shocking was that he had each one perfectly down. Hyashi smiled. At least he is dedicated. Hyashi smiled at the boy, finally speaking I see you got them all down. Naruto turned to look at the man. He could only smile before he collapsed onto the white sand that was the training terrain. Hyashi called for a branch family member to pick up the boy and take him back to his rooms. That Naruto. He'll make a fine Hayuga and an even better husband for Hinata. End flashback. It was now the third week. Hinata was panting with exertion as she climbed up the face of the cliff, using chakra to stick to the sides. She had been the first to figure this out, and with careful whispers, she had told the other two how to do it. She reached the top and back flipped off of it, gracefully turning in the air. She hit the ground running, jumping and dodging the kunai that were flying from behind trees as she sprinted the last 50 meters to the finish line. Naruto and Kuji were only seconds behind her. They all crossed the finish line and turned to Aviki sensei When he looked up from his stopwatch, they all snapped to attention, legs together and arms at their sides, head straight. Shoulders back, chest out. You maggots did well today. You made it in less than three minutes. As a reward, I will now teach you some jutsu. Keep up the good work, and I'll teach you more each day. Hinata was glad that he wasn't going to be adding more weights. At the end of their first week, 
When they finally finished the obstacle course in less than three minutes, he had given them bracelets and anklets that were 50 pounds each, and a 100-pound flak jacket. Yes, it was an extreme amount, but soon they got over it and learned to walk normally. Soon, they grew accustomed to the weight, but they were back to square one. It took them another week and a half before today, finally finishing in less than three minutes. Today, we'll be learning a different jutsu each. Charlie, remember these seals. Iviki flashed a series of seals at Kuji before putting his hand next to his mouth in an O shape, blowing through it. A huge fireball exploded outwards, burning down several trees and scorching several others in the vicinity. That was Katan, Gukaku in no jutsu. Each time you fail to create a fireball earns you a lap around Konoha and a run through the obstacle course. Sir, yes sir. Kuji took a few steps to the side and started practicing his jutsu. Alpha, front and center. Naruto stepped forwards, directly in front of Iviki. The jutsu you'll be learning doesn't require any hand seals. However, it takes an immense amount of chakra, as well as near-perfect control to master. Gather the chakra in your palm. When your palm is glowing, thrust your hand forwards and release it in a cone shape. Be sure to let it explode outwards, like this. Iviki thrust his hand outwards and a huge blast of blue chakra blew outwards in a roughly cone-like shape. It hit several trees, instantly vaporizing the places they hit, and scorching the ones that only took a glancing blow. Now, get practicing. Sir, yes sir. Beta. Hinata just looked straight at Iviki walked up to her. He raised a hand, and a woman in a doctor's outfit walked into the clearing. This is Miho-san. You will be learning some advanced chakra control exercises as well as some medical jutsu. You will treat her with the same respect you show me. If I catch even a whisper of you not paying attention, you will run 500 laps around Konoha, regardless of the time it takes you to do so. Are we clear? Sir, yes sir. Good. Move out. Miho took Hinata and walked off to another clearing. Iviki watched the progress of the other two, teaching them a new jutsu after they had mastered the previous one. And that became their routine. They did their laps, their exercises, the obstacle course, and then learned jutsu until dinner time. After they ate, they would return to the clearing to learn team strategy. By the time the six weeks were up, the three combined could take down Iviki and leave him struggling to get untied from the tree they usually tied him to. He had even taught them a fair amount of psychology and interrogation techniques. This included a fair amount of genjutsu, so that aspect of their training was not left out. The last day of training had arrived. They were not meeting at the training grounds, as they usually did, but at a small sparring field, complete with bleachers and everything. The Hokage himself, as well as several council members were sitting there. It seemed that a fair amount of Jounin and Chounin were also present. Today is your final day in training. You have each come a long way since you were first put under my leadership. The first part of your task is a fight. At these words, three tough-looking Chounin stood and walked onto the field. You must defeat these three using any means necessary. Kill if you must, but only as a last resort. Understood, sir? Yes sir. Good. Now, are both teams ready? Sir? Yes sir. Let's just get this over with the Chounin said. Begin. With a flash, Hinata dashed forwards. The Chounin all pulled out kunai and were about to jump her when she jumped to the side. Naruto's palm was glowing. With a thrust, he yelled chakra blast no jutsu. The Chounin could only throw up a hasty guard and use chakra to protect themselves at the last moment. They were still thrown back from the force of the blast. Doten, Doryu Taiga. The dirt underneath the Chounin turned into a mud river. Although the Chounin managed to twist in midair to land on their feet, the mud was thick enough to make them sink up to their knees and hold them there. Haki Rakuhu Yachao. The world paused for a moment. Hinata took a deep breath, and slowly let it out. When the world finally started up again, her hands were a blur, striking each of the Chounin too quick for even most of the Jounin to see. By the time she had finished her attack, she was on the other side of all three of the Chounin. The Dodenjutsu released itself and the Chounin fell. They struggled to stand, but they found their bodies unable to respond to their commands. It was over, and they knew it. Well done, Team 7. Fall in. The three Jinan lined up in front of Iviki, standing at attention. About face. They smartly spun around to face the shocked onlookers. They were stunned that a group of Jinan had just bested three mid-level Chounin. Several mouths were wide open, and everyone was staring. Iviki decided it was time for the last test. Beta, one step forward. Hinata stepped forward. Neil. Hinata was down on her knees. Alpha, Charlie, you two are ordered to kill your teammate. The tension could be felt as the two Janan hesitated. Finally, Naruto spoke up. Sit, I cannot do that, sir. And just why not, Maggot? This is a direct order. Sir, I refuse to kill my teammate, 
Sir, Charlie, kill Beta and then take care of the traitor. Kuji shook with rage. Sir, I cannot do that. Sir, you two are a disgrace. I'll have you tried and executed for insubordination. You have one last chance. Kill them. Sir, I refuse. Sir, you. Pass. The entire crowd just gaped. A now smiling Aviki just stood there, grinning at his students. Sir, what do you mean, sir? I mean you three pass. You pass the test. In our line of work, teamwork is stressed above all else. You three just proved that your teamwork could best some mid-level Chinese, and you three stuck together, ignoring ridiculous orders, even if it meant your deaths. A person who doesn't follow the rules is trash, but those who abandon their teammates are worse trash. Remember that quote. Now, because you are no longer trainees, we are officially a Jinan team. From now on, you will no longer call me sir, but Aviki sensei We will be taking missions from now on, although I hope you continue to train and grow stronger. The three Jinan, although they had been taught to stand at attention with no emotion, broke into grins. Iviki walked in front of them and held out three objects. Here are your forehead protectors. Bear them with pride, for you are now Konoha Shinobi. The three were overflowing with pride and happiness, now that their harsh training had been completed. They bowed deeply before taking their respective forehead protectors and wearing them how they saw fit. Hinata wore hers around her neck, loosely tied. Naruto wore his on his left leg, between the thigh and the knee. Kuji wore his around his forehead, but did not split his hair down the middle. The three were grinning happily, finally able to wear them for the first time. Iviki-san, I am impressed by the first batch of students. Iviki turned and bowed to the Hokage. Should these three be able to live a decent social life on top of being shinobi, I will allow you to begin training some Jounin on how to train the next batch of Jinan. If all of the next batch turn out as good as this one, I will make the Morino method standard for all academy graduates to participate in before becoming Jinan. I believe that a much more intense program should be used to train Jounin for their special classes, such as Anbu or Hunter Nin, or Combat Specialist. I believe you are the man for the job. However, because you took on a Jinan team, you must see them through until one is a Chinese and can take over as team leader. Report at my office at 8 o'clock tomorrow for your first batch of missions. Hi, Hokage-sama. Iviki turned towards the Jinan once again. You three have the rest of the day off. I suggest getting back in contact with your friends. I'm sure you miss them. Oh, and one more thing. He reached into the pockets of his trench coat and pulls out three decently sized envelopes. This is the payment you three received for completing an A-rank mission. Iviki saw the confused look on his students' faces. Your training was considered an A-rank mission. You three participated in an experimental training program. That in itself is dangerous, but also you affected the outcome of the village. It appears that all shinobi will undergo this training before becoming Shinan. Now, go take some time off, you deserve it. Thank you, Iviki sensei Naruto said. Come on, Hinata, Kuji, it's time we visit Ichirakus. You'll love it there, they serve the best ramen in all of Konoha. Iviki smiled as his three students walked off. You three will become strong and you'll go far. I wish you luck. Chapter 5 The three freshly graduated Janan were walking down the road, chatting happily. Of course, they were ecstatic that they had finally finished the brutal training program Iviki Sensei had dreamt up. Thinking about it made them shudder, and they were sure they would for the rest of their lives. However, it did make them stronger. Far stronger than they had imagined it would. Hinata, although still shy when it came to people, was rather confident in her abilities on the battlefield. Although she no longer stuttered, she didn't slouch and slink around trying to avoid attention. She walked somewhat normally, although she still didn't like to start conversations. Once she was comfortable with someone's presence, she would chat normally with them. Kuji was still somewhat big-boned even after the program. However, underneath the fat, there was a layer of rock-hard muscles. Sure, he could still convert the fat into an instant burst of chakra but it was supported by a large amount of stamina and slow releasing chakra from his muscles. His fighting style benefited from the change, as he was much more agile now, both normally and in his meat tank attack. With the addition of the spikes, he could change direction at the blink of an eye, and would usually hit on the first or second try. Even if the opponent was good enough to dodge those attacks, he, or she, would be either immobilized by Hinata, or destroyed from a distance by Naruto, or most often a combination of the two. Kuji's stamina is well complemented by the many jutsu he learned from Iviki Sensei. He knew almost all of the Jinan and Chunin level jutsu from all five elemental attacks, as well as a fair amount of the Jounin level jutsu. He also knew a fair amount of special jutsu that didn't align to a certain element, such as Cage Bunshine and other such jutsu. Iviki, nor many other shinobi for that matter, 
knew a lot of raw chakra attacks. Most of the ones Naruto had learned were from memories of the Kyuubi's attacks. Although they really didn't know the names of them, in truth they were just the molding and manipulation of raw power. However, Naruto had developed a number of original attacks, such as the Amatsu Tenshi no Senshu Heavenly Angel's Bow, it basically created a rod of pure energy in one of Naruto's hands. Then, with a chakra string, he bent it and created an arrow of pure chakra. It worked a lot like a normal bow, but the arrow could do a myriad of things, such as explode on contact, or completely burn through an opponent. If he aimed the bow correctly, it could be used to knock out an even burnt Anketsu. A burnt Anketsu is like a chakra burn, but because of the damage, it is closed until it has healed. It requires a lot of chakra to use, as well as a rather decent spin to the chakra entering the Tenketsu to do enough damage to burn it shut, making it almost impossible to use during close combat, making it impossible to use with Jiken. Because of all this, Naruto has become very skilled as a long-range fighter, and as Aviki sensei had taught all of them Cage Bunshine, Naruto could create an entire army of chakra archers, making for a rather painful volley of well-aimed arrows. It was extremely deadly. Also, Naruto was the supplies officer for the team, meaning he used special sealing scrolls to seal away the large supply of food that was consumed between him and Kuji. It saved both space and weight, and they could seal as much stuff as they had scrolls and ink without changing their weight too much. It also came useful for weapons and medical kits, and other such odds and ends. Putting the scrolls in plastic bags made them impervious to water, so they never had to worry about running out of supplies while on missions. Iviki sensei had really covered all the bases with his training. Despite their intimidating skills, the three had come out of the training relatively unscathed, mentally. Although they hated the training, and didn't like thinking about it, they were all much stronger because of it, and therefore they were glad they went through it. If they had the chance to go back in time to undo the training, they wouldn't stop it for all the money in Fire Country. Now, they knew that they were going to be accepting missions tomorrow, and were rather exited. But, they had tonight off and due to Naruto's obsession with ramen, they were going to Ichiraku's. As they were nearing the stand, they, quite literally, ran into several rather grumpy people. Of course, no one from Team 7 fell down, but the other people weren't so lucky. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Naruto said, extending his hand down to help up the person who was sitting on the ground, rubbing her rather tender behind. Watch where you're going, Dobe. The icy, yet apathetic voice that spoke was very familiar to Naruto. Ha, who are you calling Dobe? Uchiha-san said Naruto, his voice having a rather stinging edge to it as I recall, you were runner-up in the class rankings, beaten by. Who was it again? Oh, that's right. It was me. I guess I'm just not so full of myself that I go about claiming to be superior to everyone else because I scored higher than them. The last Uchiha in Konohaga Kour, said to be the most cold-hearted shinobi in Konoha bested only by Ice Queen Gurunai, was livid. His face was a rather unhealthy shade of red and several veins could be seen on his forehead and neck, sticking out rather painfully to everyone looking at him. You may be the last Uchiha, but you're still no Hyuga. Go off and play Shinobi with the academy students. You're wasting my time. Come on, guys. With that, the three walked off. Kuji, who had hated Sasuke because he was one of the kids that had teased him when he was young, just brushed past him, ignoring the Jinan. Hinata made a quick apology and left with a small bow but as it was little more than the nodding of a head, it enraged Sasuke even more. Sakura and Dino were obviously torn between their two idols. Sure, most of the adults didn't trust Naruto, even after they learned he didn't have QB sealed inside of him and that he had been adopted and carried the full weight of the Hyuga name behind him, but most of the younger generation was a part of the Hyuga Naruto and Uchiha Sasuke fan club. To see both objects of their affections fight with each other was rather distressing. After a moment, the two girls started trying to soothe Sasuke's bruised ego and calm the boy down. Don't listen to him, Sasuke. You're better than him any day. Yeah, I bet he couldn't beat you in a fight if his life depended on it. How ironic those words would be. Sasuke just brushed them off, shaking his shoulder to remove their hands that had been set there, and walked off, hands in his pockets, brooding. I'll kill my brother, and when I'm done with him, you're next, Hayuga Naruto. With that, he walked off to go train. When Naruto, Hinata, and Kuji rounded the corner, they burst out laughing. Uchiha Sasuke, although popular amongst most of the girls, save for Hinata, was not very well liked by the younger generation. He was coddled by the adults, and merely tolerated by his peers. His rather stinging remarks, when he spoke at all, were not taken kindly by their targets. Nice one, Naruto. You really handed it to him on a silver platter, Kuji said, with a large grin. Naruto-kun. 
you play the part of a stuck-up Hyuga almost as good as Neji Nissan. Although, I'm glad that you don't have a stick up your ass, like he does Hinata said, with a small giggle. Yeah, and that Sasuke is even worse. He doesn't just have a stick up his ass, he's got an icicle. Always trying to outdo everyone and I don't think even Neji-san would even go that far, Kuji said, with a rather evil chuckle. Thanks, guys. I don't know what came over me. It was bad enough he thinks he's better than everyone else, but to call me Adobe when he scored lower than me? That just blew me over the edge. Anyway, there's Ichirakus. Let's go. As they walked under the flaps to enter the small stand, they saw three of the stools were already occupied. Hey, Shikamaru. Long time, no see, Kuji said, Shikamaru turned on his stool and stood. He was surprised when Kuji enveloped him in a friendly bear hug. Ak, Kuji, you're squishing me. Oh, sorry. Kuji set him gently back down to the ground, and Shikamaru stumbled slightly after being let go. Troublesome. When did you get this strong? Shikamaru. The laziest ninja in Konoha, had an interested expression on his face. Kiba turned around to face the three newcomers. Yeah, how did that special training go under that madman, Akibi or whatever his name is? Bark. Akamaru was sitting in Kiba's jacket. He seemed to bark each time as an interjection to Kiba's outbursts. A small amount of killer intent came off Naruto as he spoke. His name is Aviki, don't get it wrong again. He's a better sensei than you'll ever have, even if his training method is rather unorthodox. Kiba wilted under Naruto's glare, and Akamaru whimpered slightly. His eyes were as intimidating as the Hyugas in full Byakugan, although Naruto never got the veins and his eyes were always active. He softened and gave Akamaru a little pat. Nice to see you again, Akamaru. How's Kiba treating you? Akamaru barked once and would have been shaking his tail, if he wasn't in Kiba's jacket, he said he's doing fine, and I'm treating him well. You should see how strong he's getting. DCH. Troublesome Shikamaru said, turning back to his bowl to eat. I would like to know how far you three have progressed as well. Naruto raised an eyebrow. Shino? You have a voice? They all face vaulted and Naruto laughed. Hey, sorry. Couldn't resist. Yes, he has a voice, and I bet he could take you easily, shouted out a rather pissed Kiba bark. Growl. Again, Akamaru interjected. Well, then maybe we should do some sparring? We have the rest of the day off, and after dinner, I'd be glad to mop the floor with you. Uh. I mean spar with you. They all sweat dropped. Anyway, I'm still hungry. Let's get some food. I'll have one pork ramen, three shrimp ramen, two beef, and a chicken to round it off. All deluxe sized. Coming right up, said a grinning Ayami as she prepared the bowls for their number one customer. Ano. I'll have a shrimp ramen. And I'd like six barbecue pork and three barbecue beef ramen please. Kuji could eat as much as Naruto when it came to ramen. The other team sweat dropped at all the food that had been ordered. Hinata-chan. Do they always eat this much? Asked a curious Kiba. I'm afraid do. At least they eat with some manners, instead of choking it down as fast as possible. Indeed, Naruto and Kuji were eating with a fair amount of manners. They gracefully lifted the noodles, allowing them to cool for a moment, before dipping them into the steaming broth before gracefully consuming them. Naruto had eaten like this since his adoption into the Hyuga, but Kuji used to be a wild and rather rude eater, slurping and gobbling the food down as fast as possible. It appeared that the bonding time during the week-long survival training in the woods with Aviki sensei had allowed the Hyuga to pass down their manners to their large friend. After Hinata had finished her bowl, she chatted nonchalantly with Kiba, Shino, and Shikamaru while Naruto and Kuji listened while finishing their ramen. After the two finished, they joined in the conversation and eventually the talk drifted to missions, so. Shikamaru Naruto started what kind of missions have you been doing since you graduated? Shikamaru tilted his head back and rubbed his temples with one hand, it covering his eyes in the process. So troublesome. Naruto raised an eyebrow at his behavior. They suck, yelled Kiba. All these D-rank missions are nothing more than shit jobs. What does catching the daimyo's cat and babysitting have to do with being a ninja? For Kami-sama's sake, the academy students should have these missions, not Janan. I'm more than ready for a challenge. Bark. Akamaru sounded both pissed and annoyed at the same time, pretty good for a dog. I agree with Kiba, said Shino, and for the first time ever, the collected group actually saw him bristling with anger and annoyance. He noticed them staring at him. What? Nothing. They all said in unison, finding various objects around them suddenly incredibly interesting. Who knew that salt shakers in the back of Ayame's head could be so interesting? After a moment of awkward silence, Naruto stood up and pulled out his wallet, paying for his ramen and leaving a decent tip. Well, it's getting late, so if we're going to be doing some sparring, 
We should get going, yes. Kuji and Kiba shouted in unison, eager to test their abilities. Troublesome, Shikamaru said. Hinata and Shino just stayed silent, following Naruto as he got up, walking off to the training ground. After a half hour, enough time for Naruto and Kuji to digest their food intake without worrying about vomiting during the exercises, they arrived at a training field. Before we start, we should all do some stretches and some warm-ups. Hinata may be a good medic nin, but we still don't need to be pulling a muscle or tearing a tendon because we were careless. Even Shikamaru, with a small troublesome, joined the group in stretching and doing some laps around the training field. As they were not looking for an intruder or an observer, no one noticed that Sasuke had taken up a position in a tree with a pair of binoculars to watch the action. He had been brooding on top of a roof as the group went by, and had decided to follow them when he heard Kiba shouting out challenges to everyone, exited at the prospect of sparring with them. He had dashed home to grab his binoculars after finding out where they were sparring. He had arrived back in time to see them finishing up their last couple of laps. Okay, how should we do this? Surprisingly, it was Shino who spoke up. We should go one-on-one -on -one fights. As a team, we are specialized for hunting and retrieving, not combat. We, as a team, only have the advantage with our surprise attacks. Naruto nodded before pulling out a scroll, and after looking through it, he palmed a set of kanji. With a small puff of smoke, a board game puffed into existence. They all sweat dropped. Oi, Naruto, what's the game for? Shouted Kiba. I don't want the game, I want the dice. Naruto pulled out the dice and gave one to each person. Okay, this is how it'll work. The lowest rollers from each team will fight each other, as will the high rollers. The two left will fight each other also. Any objections? Troublesome. But I think some rules should be placed down. 1. No killing blows. Two. If the fight is getting out of hand, those not fighting will stop it. And 3. No weapons. I don't know if Hinata can heal a pierced jugular from a slipped hand or a botched dodge. We don't need to be killing each other. Everyone either nodded or voiced their opinion, and Kiba did so rather loudly. Good. Then let's roll. Everyone took their dice and shook it in their hands. San, Ni, Ichi, Go. Naruto counted down. After saying Go, everyone dropped their dice onto the ground, careful to track theirs and not get someone else's. The matchups were Kuji vs Kiba first, Hinata vs Shino second, and Naruto vs Shikamaru third. Okay, Kuji, Kiba, get ready. I'll act as judge. When I call the fight, you both stop instantly, got it. Troublesome, Shikamaru said. The two fighters nodded and walked out of ways, facing each other with glares. I'm gonna kick your ass, fatty. Kuji only grinned, used to being called names so much that it didn't matter to him anymore. Begin, Kiba shouted some random insults and Akamaru jumped on Kiba's back. Juujin Bunshine, he shouted after a few hand seals. A puff of smoke later, and two rather feral looking Kibas appeared, one on the other's back. Let's go Akamaru. They both took off at incredible speeds at Kuji. A series of hand seals that were difficult to follow because they were so quickly executed brought out one of Kuji's favorite jutsu, Doten. Shinja Uzanshu no jutsu. Kuji sank into the ground before Kiba could reach him. Kiba and Akamaru stopped sniffing the air. Their efforts were futile, as Kuji was walking through the earth as easily as on top of it, and his scent couldn't be followed. Suddenly, a large mud dragon rose from in front of the boy and his dog, flying directly at them. They dodged in either direction as the dragon impacted the dirt beneath them. The mud washed over Kiba's legs up to and over his knees, effectively trapping him in the bog like goo. Akamaru was buried up to his neck. Kuji jumped out of the ground, and as he was landed, he finished a bunch of hand seals, calling out Katan. How's Gano Jutsu? The fireballs he spat out impacted the area around the ninja and his dog. Ha, your aim is so bad you couldn't even hit us, Kibi yelled. Kuji just landed and smiled. Try getting out, Kuji said. Kiba looked down and saw that the dirt around him had been solidified, and was nearly impossible to get out of. Akamaru could only whimper as he was stuck. Winner, Kuji, said a slightly surprised Shikamaru. Kuji grinned and sank into the dirt once again, only to pull Kiba and Akamaru under and pull them back up to the surface. Kiba looked crestfallen. Kuji reached his hand out. Kiba slowly moved his hand into Kuji's, and the shook. Good fight, Kiba. Thanks, Kuji. Okay, Hinata vs Shino. Get ready, Naruto shouted eager to get to the next match. The two fighters walked out to the middle of the field and nodded at each other. Hinata fell into her jukan stance, while Shino just stood there. Begin. Hinata rushed at Shino, who just stood there. Hinata's hands were a blur as they flew out and struck several parts of Shino's body, flashes of chakra flying out his back. 
Hinata jumped away after noticing several hundred bugs trying to crawl up her leg. Shino just stood there, casually stretching his arms and legs, showing the Hyuga heiress that he was unaffected by her attack. What? How? Asked Hinata. Your attacks are chakra-based attacks. My Kikai bugs eat chakra. It's a simple matter of them coating my body and eating the chakra that would otherwise close my tenkatsu. Hinata suddenly felt weak. With a blast of chakra and a spin, she activated the kaiden to remove the bugs from her back. Jumping after she finished, she used several decent acrobatic moves to jump away. She made the familiar cross seal and said cage bunshine no jutsu. Several Hinatas appeared, each one taking up a position around Shino. His bugs managed to crawl up one and after absorbing all the chakra in the clone, it dissipated. Hinata and her clones charged after the poof of the clone, throwing a myriad of Jukan attacks, as well as using a fist for several of the attacks, changing between physical and chakra attacks to keep Shino guessing. After a few moments, Hinata jumped back and her clones dissipated. Shino fell down to his knees, and slowly fell face down onto the ground. Hinata stood back and relaxed as her opponent was down. Shino suddenly became a mass of bugs, which rose up in a wave and flew at Hinata, who jumped back and tried to dodge the attacks, only to run into the real Shino behind her. She spun around and attacked him. Surprisingly, Shino was decent at Daijutsu, and managed to either block or dodge most attacks. By the time Shino was ready to collapse, the bugs had reached Hinata and started draining chakra. They both struggled to stay conscious, but failed, and collapsed at the same time. I guess it's a tie then. Naruto ran out to Hinata and started shaking her as Shino's bugs withdrew into their host's body. Oi, Hinata. Wake up. He pulled out a soldier pill and stuck it in her mouth. She involuntarily swallowed. After a few seconds, the pill took effect, and her eyes flew open. She sat up suddenly and looked around. Naruto had just deposited another soldier pill into Shino's slightly open mouth. Naruto-kun? What happened? Ano. You were sparring with Shino, and you tied. You both passed out at the same time. You were great. You kept him guessing the whole time. Hinata blushed slightly. Thank you, Naruto-kun. Shino woke and stood up, walking back to the sidelines. Hinata just sat there, staring into Naruto's eyes. So much like mine, but so different. Her thoughts eventually turned to other things. She blushed more. Naruto stood up and grabbed her hand, helping her to her feet. Thank you, Naruto-kun. No problem, Hinata-chan. He called me Hinata-chan. Hinata blushed even more and almost fainted before she reached the others, finally coming to her senses as Kiba yelled wow, great fight, Hinata. I've never seen anyone move so fast. You were awesome. Thanks, Kiba-san. You did well, Shino-san. Very clever use of a Bunshine hybrid. I thought it was you but it really kept me guessing when it turned into a mass of bugs. You're very good. Thank you, Hinata-san. You did very well yourself. So troublesome. I guess it's time for our fight, Naruto. Yeah, I guess so. You ready? Troublesome. They walked out to the middle of the field. Hinata decided to play the role of judge in place of Shikamaru, as he was now fighting. Sasuke, still unnoticed by everyone, looked on with anticipation. Time to see your abilities, Naruto Baka. Naruto took up a Juken stance, only where his outstretched hand should have been sideways, it was held much more like Rockley's. His backhand was held normally, and his weight was shifted backwards. Ready? DCH, troublesome. Whenever you are. Naruto didn't notice that the shadows under Shikamaru were already stretching out to him. Begin. With that, Shikamaru's shadow touched Naruto's who was now completely immobile. Cage main successful. Shikamaru reached into a pouch and pulled out several shuriken. This was the normal shadow bind, not shadow imitation, so Naruto didn't move at all. With a flick of his wrist, Shikamaru threw the shuriken at Naruto, doing several hand seals along the way. Cage shuriken no jutsu. The three shuriken multiplied into 16 shuriken. Naruto's eyes widened as they impacted. Poof. The shadow clone burst into smoke. Nani, you think I'd fall for that? You underestimated me. Naruto's voice seemed to come from both everywhere and nowhere at the same time. It unnerved the group, and Shikamaru most of all. Now, let's end this. Amatsu Tenshi no Senshu, Yasisha. Dozens upon dozens of blue chakra arrows burst into the field from the woods all around them. They came from every direction and in such numbers that even as Shikamaru dodged the first ones, he fell directly into the patch of the next group. The arrows dissipated as they struck the shadow user, each one hitting like a punch. Needless to say, Shikamaru was hurting after that attack. He fell onto his knee as a final arrow came flying out of the undergrowth. Jinja Fusei Inoya. 
Knockout arrow. The arrow struck Shikamaru on the forehead. He instantly passed out. Sasuke had been watching the entire fight, and was surprised when several Naruto clones appeared underneath the tree he was sitting in. He was even more surprised when they both reached out their right hands and produced a large pole of chakra. Then, a chakra string attached itself to either end of the pole and pulled taunt, creating a bow made entirely out of chakra. Sasuke was amazed. It would take incredible chakra control to make this. He almost fell out of the tree when each Naruto clone pulled the chakra strings back, and a blue chakra arrow appeared by their hands in the correct position. Each Naruto released the arrow and they sped out to their intended target, Shikamaru. Sasuke looked through the binoculars again just in time to see Shikamaru get hit from all sides by a large amount of these chakra arrows. Then, finally, one last arrow hit him in the forehead, and Shikamaru dropped. Sasuke could only stand there. Naruto had used clones to make an attack that would require an incredibly large amount of chakra as well as the control needed to shape and shoot the bow. Damn it. He's already so strong. I need to work harder to surpass him. If I can surpass Naruto, I can beat my brother. The clones dissipated, and Sasuke jumped down and walked back to town, hands in his pockets, brooding as usual. He didn't even notice when Ino and Sakura threw themselves unabashedly at him, completely brushing off the two fangirls. He had a lot of training to do. Chapter 7 Naruto was getting his pack ready. After nearly a month straight of D-rank missions, the team was bored out of their minds. Finally, Naruto snapped and requested a much more challenging mission from the Hokage. Flashback The three Janan and their sensei sat in front of the Hokage's bureau. Naruto, despite having been coached by the Hyuga to remain impassive at all times, had a strange twitch in his eyebrow that he couldn't manage to get rid of. Just the mention of the daimyo's cat seemed to aggravate his condition. It didn't help that the subject of their conversation with the Hokage was that particular problem. Wife's cat has escaped again. It was last seen in the vicinity of the Hokage Monument Lookout Point. Excuse my interruption, Hokage Sama Naruto said. But I believe that at the rate we have been accomplishing our missions would leave few or none for the other Jinan teams. That would be both unjust and anti-productive. Is there, by any chance, a mission that would be a bit more of a challenge for us? Sundaime Hokage raised an eyebrow at Naruto's behavior. His manners certainly have improved since he started living at the Hyuga compound. I'm sorry to say that the last low C ranked mission was just given to Team 8. It was then that the gods decided to pity the plight of Team 7 and arranged for their wish to be granted. The door to the Hokage's office burst open and a Jian and ran up to the Hokage's desk to hand him a sealed scroll. Hokage-sama, we have received word from one of the Chunin border patrol teams. The team in charge of Sector 15 on the border of fire and rice countries had suffered a casualty. They send a report via Summon Hawk, and their report is in here. With that, the man bowed and walked out, closing the doors behind him. The Hokage opened the scroll and read the report. Although he held his face in a sort of apathy, the look in his eyes seemed to tell both Naruto and Hinata, who have been trained in the Hyuga way of reading emotions, that something was amiss. Well, Team 7, you're in luck. One of the Chunin has been injured and will require medical treatment. His injuries are severe enough that the team's medic nin cannot completely heal him. He will have to be brought back to the hospital. You are to escort the team of medics to the site, meet up with his team, and your team will support the other two Chunin in their task of border patrol. This is a mid-sea ranked mission, and there may be contact with enemy ninja in non-combat situations. Will you accept this mission? The three looked at Iviki sensei and nodded. Iviki, in turn said we accept this mission. When will the medic team be ready to leave? They will leave by noon. That gives you four hours to prepare and meet them at the hospital entrance. Bring enough supplies for a two weeks day. That is all. Hi, Hokage-sama. The three Janan said in unison. End flashback. Naruto steadied himself in the mirror. His off-white, almost cream-colored jacket would not blend well in the green of the trees he would be patrolling in. He smiled and reached into his closet to pull out his new outfit he had recently acquired. Flashback. Again. The day before their meeting with the Hokage, Naruto was taking a couple hours to relax. Not content in the stuffy Hyuga compound, he decided that he would go shopping. Strange thing for a man to do. In any case, mostly he just browsed the vendors that had set their wares up on the side streets. There were some interesting trinkets, but unfortunately for both Naruto and the vendors, the Hyuga pride had really begun to rub off on Naruto. These things are only semi-precious stones set in common metal. Not something a Hyuga should wear. Soon. He decided to visit a weapon shop. Usually, he went to the one that was run by Tenten's family, as she was a good friend of Neji Nisan. Today, however, 
His eyes were caught by a different store. He entered the small shop and subtly admired the decent display of weapons around the walls and aisles. What really caught his eye was the glass counter and what was held inside it. The sign on top of the counter read customized forehead protectors available here. Naruto was instantly intrigued. The owner of the store was, rather unfortunately, one of the few people that didn't believe the son Daime when he announced Naruto's heritage and the fact that Kyuubi was no longer part of this world. However, this was offset by the fact that Naruto was not only a main branch member of the esteemed Hyuga clan, but also held in high regards by Hyashi-sama. Excuse me, sir, but how much would it be to customize a headband from scratch? After a moment of mental debating, the shop owner replied in a rather neutral voice, That depends on what you want to put on it. Naruto nodded and took a moment to think. Then I would like to purchase one. The man nodded and pulled out a slip of paper. And what would you like to put on it? First, I want the metal blackened and unable to reflect light. Next, carve the leaf symbol to the left side of it and the Hyuga flames on the right. The only shine should be in the carvings themselves. The shop owner wrote down the instructions and mentally tallied up the price. The price will be, approximately 8,950 Rio. Naruto dug out his wallet, thankfully not Gama-chan this time. He pulled out a 10,000 Rio note and handed it to the man, who got his change and handed it back. Before Naruto left the store, he asked the man one final question. When is the soonest I can it up? Ah. For another 1,000 Rio. I can have it finished by 6 o'clock tonight. Naruto smiled and flipped him two 500 Ryo coins, which the man caught before smiling and wishing him a good day. Naruto was in a particularly good mood, and decided to stop by a ninja outfit store that had been highly praised by several branch members. Apparently, the shop was new in town, and the owner was from Wind Country. He had a fair amount of interesting outfits in a style from an ancient civilization known as the Pashan. Making his way across town, he finally stopped by the store. Before he went in, his eyes were yet again drawn to a window display. The mannequin that stood there had on the outfit that had caught Naruto's eye. It was completely black, and didn't reflect any light whatsoever. The pants looked to be skin tight, but were in fact quite comfortable, and near the bottoms of the legs it seemed to be tied by black bandages. The shirt was very much the same, but only the arms were tied. The pants and the shirt were held by a black sash that was barely visible, but seemed adjustable. The entire head of the mannequin was wrapped and the only place showing was a small slit for the eyes. Each of the wrapped areas had tails at least a foot long that Naruto could imagine would flutter quite intimidatingly in a slight breeze. It almost looked like shadows were rolling off the outfit, giving it an extremely cool look. Imagine the Sand Wraith Prince, from Prince of Persia, Warrior Within, only with a wrapped head instead of a mask. Naruto instantly went into the store and had his measurements taken for an outfit identical to the one he saw. He paid the shopkeeper a rather sizable tip to have it finished by nightfall, and of course the man complied, as he did not have too many orders at the moment. This was only his first week open for business, and word had not spread around to overwhelm him with orders. Naruto did, however, take the long piece of cloth used to tie his head up before leaving the store. Making his way back to the weapons shop, he instructed the man to put the customized headband on the black cloth so that it would be on Naruto's forehead when he wore his outfit. Looking around the weapons shop again. As it was around 5.30 already, Naruto decided to stay until his headband was finished. Strangely enough, today seemed like a rather compulsive day for Naruto, as his eye was again caught by something. A small black box was sitting in the corner of a room. A thin layer of dust covered it as it had not been opened in a while. Carefully lifting the lid up, Naruto peeked inside. In black velvet, there sat two of the most exotic weapons Naruto had ever seen, along with an old-looking scroll. The weapons themselves were familiar to Naruto, as they were merely a short sword and a dagger. It was the fact that they were both strangely shaped that caught Naruto's eyes. Both were completely black, but they had silver accents along the handle and guards. The hilts were inlaid with obsidian stones that seemed to shine with an inner darkness. Strange as it sounded, it's the only way Naruto could describe it. Naruto grinned his true grin. It wasn't the stuck-up Hayuga I'm better than you smirk, nor was it the I'm completely happy. Nothing is wrong grin he had used as a child. This was a foxy grin that, should anyone have seen it, would have made people shudder at the killing intent behind it. Naruto was imagining himself in his new outfit, wielding these strange looking weapons. He assumed that the scroll was a learning course on how to wield them properly, and he guessed correctly. Glancing at the clock above the counter, he picked up the box and headed back to the register to await the store owner. Several minutes after 6 o'clock, the man finally stepped out of the back room holding the customized forehead protector that Naruto had purchased. The man was smiling to himself as he saw the box, thinking finally, someone takes an interest in those weapons. I was beginning to think no one would buy them. 
Let's see if I can't drive the price up a bit. Ah, I see you found something that caught your eyes? Yes, I have. The two spent nearly an hour haggling a price, and the icy Hyuga glare no jutsu that Naruto used was rather effective. Gotta thank Neji for teaching me that one. Thought Naruto as he paid a decent 16,500 Rio for the box and its contents. He he he, I doubled the money I spent buying this from that traveler. Life sure is good. Especially when rich people are involved. The shopkeeper was grinning happily as Naruto left the shop with his purchases, heading back to the cloth store to pick up his outfit before finally going back to the Hyuga Manor and almost literally falling into bed, fatigued from a long day of shopping. Damn it, where's Naruto? He's usually not the late one. Hinata is missing too. An annoyed Iki paced in front of the hospital. The medics and Kuji fidgeted, completely aware of how. Testy Iki was when annoyed. One of the medics had to patch up a POW that Iviki had interrogated on a bad day, and she shuddered at the memory. To put it lightly, the skin was hanging off the man's face by a whisker, quite literally. Hinata landed in the middle of the group and self-consciously brushed the dust off of her usual training cloths. Go men, everyone. Naruto told me to go ahead. He said he'd be a few minutes behind me. He was still in his room when I left. Iviki sighed before speaking. It's okay, Hinata. He'll be here soon. I hope. At that moment, a figure seemed to melt out of the shadows. Shadow seemed to roll off of him and mix with the ends of the black bandages that floated around him, despite the fact that there was no wind at all that day. A small dagger was at his right hip and a hilt was visible over his left shoulder. In my fic, Naruto is gonna be left-handed, like me. Two black shuriken and kunai holsters were tied to the man's legs, as a usual ninjas were. The head was completely wrapped, only the eyes showing. Three strands of blonde hair partially obscured the man's left eye through the slit between the wrappings. The sight was so intimidating that killer intent rolled off the man, despite the fact that he wasn't consciously emitting any. Everyone there seemed to freeze up, except for Riviki, who was used to these things. They half relaxed at the sight of the modified Konoha forehead protector with the Hyuga symbol next to it, but still kept their guard. Nice to see you, Naruto. I'm liking the new outfit, Iviki said dispelling the tension immediately. Naruto put a hand behind his head, and a grin was visible behind the mask, as his eyes curled into their upside-down U-shape, much like Kakashi's. It's not too much, is it? Hinata blushed because the suit showed off Naruto's well-toned body. Kuji just grinned and kept munching his chips. Iviki grinned in malicious pleasure as he said it's great. I'd be useful to be able to intimidate this much during interrogation without even trying. Iviki drifted off. Many of his favorite interrogation techniques running through his head. Thanks, Iviki sensei Anyway, I'm ready to go. He shifted the pack on his back, also colored black. It blended well into his form, so much that it wasn't even apparent he was wearing one only after he shifted it. The small ganjutsu on it helped as well. The group ran across the rooftops of Konoha and into the tops of the trees after they passed the gates. For almost the rest of the day they ran. Luckily, they had packed light so they weren't too fatigued to set up a decent camp. That night, they took shifts watching and sleeping as they were nearing the border, and to watch for bandits. The next morning they set out as early as possible. Few words were said in trade of better efficiency in their work. Small hand signs were their only communication as they ran. They ate lunch on the go, opting for highly nutritious and surprisingly tasty field rations and water from their canteens. Around 3 or 4 in the afternoon, they reached rendezvous. The two uninjured Chunin were guarding the injured one, and jumped as the group entered the clearing. State your name and your business with us one said, while drawing a kunai. Morino Iviki, I'm the Jounin instructor for Team 7, and we're escorting the medic team and replacing your downed comrade for the duration of his recovery or until another can replace us. Here are our documents. Iviki slowly pulled out the specially sealed scroll and tossed it to the men. After they made sure it wasn't booby-trapped, they're on the border and have an injured comrade not to mention outnumbered already. There being very cautions, they opened it and read it, confirming Aviki's report. They relaxed slightly, and the medics moved to treat the injured man. What are your usual patterns? Aviki asked the team leader. After they were explained to Team 7, the Jinan team and their sensei took off to take over the patrol until the other two had a chance to rest, namely until tomorrow morning. The day was rather uneventful, consisting of little more than moving through the treetops and undergrowth about two miles back from the border looking for any intruders. Hinata's Byakugan was more than helpful in their task, and the group didn't have to risk being revealed to look through rather thick branches or overgrown bushes. Naruto's bloodline was just as effective, but he didn't detect any human chakra other than their own and that of the Chunin patrollers. For the next week and a half, Team 7 fell into the rhythm of their mission, 
eventually earning the respect of the two Chunin. The two had asked to spar with them, but found that they were on the same level as Hinata and Kuji. In other words, it was a long, hard sparring session between them, but it all came down to endurance. Here, Kuji shown, while Hinata had to consume an almost dangerous amount of soldier pills. In the end, Kuji won, but Hinata only tied. The two didn't even want to try to take on Iviki, and Naruto looked much more intimidating than the interrogation specialist. Eventually, they started taking shifts for their patrolling. The Chunin would patrol from sunrise to about 3 in the afternoon. They would return to camp and eat with the just waking group too, which were Iviki and Kuji. They would, in turn, patrol from 3 until around a little after nightfall. Then, they would return to camp and eat, only to be replaced by Hinata and Naruto. They would then take their turn patrolling until around sunrise, when they would return to camp and wake the two Chunin and eat breakfast. Right now, Naruto and Hinata were just waking up for their 3 o'clock lunch. Naruto yawned and stretched, using a combination of a low-level sudenjutsu and a low-level katanjutsu to make himself a hot shower outside the camp aways. Now, usually one wouldn't think that a Hyuga would be a... Um... Well, they will never be called that, but let's just say that Hinata seemed to take after Jiraiya. With the Byakugan, it was more than easy to peek in on Naruto taking a shower. Iviki knew what she was doing, but the others were still confused about her getting red in the face and springing a small nosebleed each and every morning. But they stopped worrying about it after the first few days. Naruto, of course, had no idea he was being spied on. Drying himself off, Naruto dressed and entered the camp. After a decent breakfast, the Chunin went to bed, Iviki and Kuji left to go on patrol, and Naruto and Hinata stayed behind. This was Hinata's favorite time of the day. Her and Naruto could be alone from now until nightfall, and they usually spent it talking, sparring, working on jutsu, or just sitting quietly. Now was one of their quiet moments. Hinata was, of course, in a mental battle. Come on, just gotta come out and say it. No, I'll look dumb. I gotta get him in the mood. But what if he gets uncomfortable? Gah I just gotta do it. Come on, come on. Come on. Say it. Naruto. I, lo. Um. Never mind. Gah, why can't I just do it? Naruto, of course, had a much different thought process. I wonder when she'll tell me. I mean. Come on, I'm not really that dense. There are only so many things I can ignore. I was taught the Hyuga art of facial reading, there's only so much I can take. I swear, as soon as this mission is over, I'm going to take her out, maybe that'll get her to confess. Kamisama this is driving me nuts. Damn it, fuck it all. I'm just going to tell her I know. Um, Hinata. Naruto's voice trailed off as a large explosion could be heard in the distance. They both turned to the direction it came from to see a large pillar of dust and smoke rise over the treetops. The two instantly jumped into the branches and started making their way to the battlefield. Hinata had her Byakugan active, scanning all around and as far towards the smoke as she possibly could. As they were leaping through the trees, she couldn't quite stop in her tracks, but she did manage to stop at the next branch. Naruto landed next to her. What's wrong? He whispered. They're outnumbered. I see at least. Ten Jounin. 15 Chunin, a score of Janan, and a squad of what looks like Anbu class. They're all from sound. The panic was rising in her voice. Naruto let out a string of some very colorful words that Hiyashi would have paled at, if he knew one of his clan's members had said anything of the sort. What about Iviki and Kuji? He not paled and looked again. Unconscious. Shit. Naruto's eyes scrunched up, and it was obvious he was thinking hard. Okay, we need to get them out of there, wake up the Chunin, alert any patrols in our vicinity and get back to Konoha. Here's what we're gonna do. Oi, Kenmaru, you sense anything? No. The area is secure, right? Yes. Good. It was at that moment that Naruto and Hinata's plan commenced. Slowly, an unnatural fog that was tinted black rolled in from the forest. The sound ninja were on edge. A-H-H, what's that? A black specter that seemed to just materialize out of the mist was seen by the group in the edges of the clearing. Its eyes glowed blue and the killing intent that rolled off of it made all but the Anbu and Jounin freeze up in fear. The shadows around it seemed to roll off of it and onto the ground. Many of the plants around the thing were wilting and dying as if their life force had been sucked out. As silently as it had appeared, it was gone. One minute it was standing there, and it just seemed to dissipate the next. Suddenly, without warning, fifty of these specters jumped out of the trees and charged forward, each engaging a nin, and all the Anbu were double-teamed, as well as some of the Jounin. The fighting was brutal, but the specters were held off. That is, until the volley of chakra arrows pierced the smoke left behind when each cage bunshine dissipated. 
Needless to say, almost all of the Zhenan and most of the Chongnin were either dead or incapacitated. Only two or three of the Zhaonan couldn't fight, but all of the Sound Nin, including the Yanbu, had some sort of injury, even if it was only a few bruises here and a closed Tenketsu there. After the volley of arrows, the wind started to blow away the mist, leaving an empty clearing. Shit. Sir, the Konoha patrol is gone. Damn it. Word could get back to their village. We need to catch them. As the group slowly pulled themselves together, they jumped into the tree branches to chase after whoever it was that had attacked them. Unfortunately for them, the trees were little more than a minefield of proximity activating explosive notes. The first few explosions took out at least one enemy in each, but after that, they became more cautious. Unfortunately for them, this slowed their progress to a crawl. The snares and projectile traps added to their losses. Needless to say, they were pissed. Hinata was again acting as the forward scout. Behind her, the real Naruto was actively gleaning the chakra around him to replenish what he had used to make the mist, cage bunshine, the volley of chakra arrows, set the traps, and place the nasty genjutsu in their wake. It was the finest one Aviki had taught them. Basically, it made each person caught in it face their greatest fear. The thing was, Naruto had poured nearly half of his chakra reserves, from the seal, into making it. The amount of chakra was more than enough to give it the power to physically inflict the wounds the genjutsu told their mind they had. It could easily be fatal. Another fourth of his total capacity was everything else he had done leaving him at one quarter power. At least, he's at one quarter of what he can access. I'll get into more detail later. To put it simply now, the seal can hold about the power of nine and a half of the tails of QB. The extra half was a buffer so that the seal wouldn't overload and break. QB was never sealed, so the seal was filled with Naruto's chakra, roughly the power of a nine tails in amount of chakra, but yokai is much more potent than even nature chakra. If those ninja catch up to us, I won't have the power to stop them. I have to replenish my reserves as soon as possible. The cage bunshine that were carrying the unconscious forms of Aviki Sensei and Kuji were also gleaning small amounts and sending it back through the link into Naruto, effectively increasing the rate at which it was gathered. Unfortunately, the cage bunshine could only do so much if they didn't want to make themselves dissipate. They shrugged and kept it as they made their way back to camp. Kagamaru rolled over in his sleeping bag. He snuggled closer to his lover. Miho, in turn, snuggled closer to him. Damn, it's too early to get up. Man, now I can't get back to sleep. He sat up and thought about how life had been since he'd started this assignment. At first, it was all business, patrolling the border with little interaction between his team and himself. But, as things progressed, Miho had fallen for him, and he felt the same way. At least their nights were no longer completely uneventful, so things weren't as bad as they could have been. Besides, there were no worries about Miho getting pregnant anytime soon. Kagamaru wasn't a medic nin for no reason. He knew all the most effective birth control jutsu, and used them accordingly. Fun. Miho groaned and sat up next to her lover. Cage kun Why are you awake so early? I can't sleep, Miho-chan. Something is telling me to get up. It was then that a group of the cage bunshine Naruto had sent reached their destination, home base. All of them except one quickly packed up everything into their respective places as neatly and efficiently as possible. One, however, had the misfortune to wake up the lovers as they had been christened by Kuji. He tapped the side of the tent a couple times to make them wake up. Oi, you two awakened there? Yes, Naruto. What do you want? Kagamaru's sleep-laden voice replied, Iviki sensei and Kuji were attacked, so Hinata and the boss are taking them back to Konoha, and try to bring reinforcements, or at least alert Konoha to the apparent invasion force. Me and the other clones are packing up the camp and heading back home. You two gotta get up and follow us so we can meet up with the boss. What? Miho and Kagamaru said in stereo. Come on, there's no time. A few minutes later, a, thankfully, fully dressed pair of Chonin exited their tent, which was rapidly taken down and placed on the back of one of the many cage bunshine that were being used as pack mules. Let's go a clone said before they took off in a seemingly random direction. The three Anbu that were left alive were stalking the group of what seemed to be three Janan, one of which was unconscious along with their Janan sensei. One had made some cage bunshine to carry their unconscious teammates. With a few hand signals, one was told to get ahead of them to stop them. After a few minutes, the Anbu appeared on a branch in front of the Hyuga that was leading the group. To say that the Anbu was surprised at her next action would be an understatement. Most Anbu expect Shinan to stop in their tracks and shake in fear when facing them. However, it seemed that Hinata had some built up rage to release. She did so, in the form of her attack. Hakiraku Uyachao. By the time she was done, 
the surprised Anbu had a large amount of Tenketsu sealed up. Sure, he had managed to block about half of the attacks, but that only resulted in disabling his arms. The final blast had been to the heart and the forehead. The Anbu thanked the gods that he'd worn his forehead protector on his forehead underneath his mask. The mask cracked, but he was saved from death. He was knocked out though, and fell from the branches. The other two Anbu continued to chase their targets, oblivious to the bone-crunching landing of their friend. It didn't help the poor ninja's career that he'd landed on his head, effectively pulverizing his spinal cord, severing most of the nerves in his neck. Ouch! Thankfully, he was unconscious before then. It seemed that luck was with the other two Anbu. With a swift kick, a volley of kunai and shuriken, and several well-placed blows, their targets were effectively held off. Hinata struggled against the ninja wire that bit into her flesh, thankful for the thick leather of her jacket to protect her arms. She had been tied up, and was being held by her throat by one of the Anbu. The other was standing over her two unconscious teammates, while Naruto could only watch as the nin holding her put a kunai against her throat. Move even an inch, and I kill her. Put her down. The icy cold look in Naruto's eyes and menace in his words told the two Anbu that if their hostages got away, their deaths would be slow and painful. But what's the worst Amir Jinan could do? Ha, you couldn't kill a fly even if you wanted to. I'll give you one last chance. Here, Naruto activated his Amatsu Tenshi no Senshu and drew the string back, letting a chakra arrow form. Let. Her. Go. What's the worst you could do? I'm an Anbu, you pathetic waste of sperm. You can't hurt me. You aren't even at the level of a Janan shit. With that, the arrow was released. Before it had traveled even a foot, it split into 128 different arrows. Naruto called out his attack. Amatsu Tenshi no Senshu Haki, Hayakanayu Hachiya. Heavenly Angel's Bow, 128 arrows of Haki. Note, this is an approximate translation. The only thing I know is right is the Hayakuna Wuhachi. I know enough Japanese to be able to count. You need to know at least that if you're gonna spend six weeks there. It helps when shopping in the open air markets. Vendors need to be able to tell you the prices of their goods. The arrows sped around the ninja, looking for all the world to have missed. The man's grin, although hidden behind a mask, faded when he saw each and every arrow curve around and strike him simultaneously. He was thrown into the air, dropping Hinata, and landed hard on his shoulder. Your tenketsu have been sealed. You cannot mold chakra anymore. Unfortunately for you, all my arrows have inserted nature chakra into your system. You have less than a minute to live. Goodbye. The smooth monotone Naruto said this in, think like Neji when he's talking about fate, sent shivers up and down the spines of both Hinata and the other Anbu. They watched in horror as the nature chakra mixed with the human chakra. The result? A modified version of life force. Unfortunately for the Anbu, he was in a woodlands. As this mixture leaked into the ground, the grass underneath him shot up, completely piercing his body. The screams he let off confirmed his pain only to be silenced later as the roots of trees pierced the man's body, sucking it dry of the precious mixture. All the plants that absorbed the life force grew before their eyes. The already gigantic trees shot up several stories above the others, and the grass stalks became as thick as Naruto's wrists, almost like bamboo. There was nothing left of the man's body save for a large clump of the supersized grass that fed off the corpse's nutrients. The other Anbu was frozen in fear. It didn't help that Naruto's gaze switched to him. Before Naruto could react, though, the Anbu pulled out a kunai and threw it at the stunned Hinata. Hinata, look out, Naruto's shout came too late. Hinata's gaze switched to the Anbu. As soon as her eyes made contact with him, she felt a massive pain in her left eye. Naruto could only watch in horror as the thrown kunai caught Hinata off guard and completely pierced her eye. Hinata's blood-curdling scream resounded through the forest as her hand reached up to try to stem the flow of blood that poured from her wound. Naruto dashed forward as Hinata fell to the ground. Hinata-chan, Hinata looked up at Naruto's face as he crouched over her. She could only see half of what she usually could. A strange calm came over her. Her voice was racked with pain. She shuddered and reached out a hand, cupping Naruto's masked face. Naruto-kun, Ashitaru. Her body went limp. Naruto grabbed her hand and held it to his face. His tears were soaking the front of his mask, but he didn't care. He could only watch as his closest friend died in his arms. He was unable to do anything. His grief slowly changed, turning itself into pure rage. Naruto stood and faced the Anbu that had thrown the kunai. The killer intent rolling off of him was strong enough that it was being felt all the way in Konoha. They'd never felt anything this strong, save for from the Kyubi. Naruto reached down into his seal, pulling all the chakra he could out of it. It fluttered and burned his chakra pathways. It wasn't enough. He kept pulling and pulling. 
rocks and clumps of dirt and grass started floating into the air by the massive amount Naruto was gathering. A revelation came over him. If I draw much more, my chakra pathways will be burned beyond use. It's not enough. Damn it, wait. What if I pull it not through my chakra pathways, but outside my body? With that though, Naruto found the hole in the seal that Kyuubi had made while escaping it that fateful day. He forced everything he had out that hole, molding it around his body. To the Anbu, he only saw the Gaki shaking in rage. Boy was he surprised when chakra exploded from his body. The chakra was shining such a bright blue that the boy's shadowed outline was the only thing visible. Naruto's eyes were glowing the same bright piercing blue that his chakra was as his bloodline captured each and every iota of chakra his seal had expelled. He gathered it around him like a shroud. It took no shape or form recognizable. It seemed to float around the boy like a wildfire, but flowed and rippled like water. The chakra shroud was huge, fully taller than the trees, despite their recent growth spurt. It tore into the ground as it swirled around him tearing spiral patterns that flowed out from him. Naruto finally had gathered enough. Naruto stretched his arm out, his hand open, extended towards the shaking form that was a sound Anbu. The chakra around Naruto flew towards his enemy, completely surrounding him. It picked him up several feet into the air. The man could only float there, completely held by the chakra that was filled with the need for his blood. Die. Naruto's cold, emotionless voice would have sent shivers down anyone's voice, but no one save for his enemy was around to hear it. The chakra formed a sphere around the man. Soon, the ball began to shrink, constricting tighter and tighter. The Anbu couldn't stop its inexorable pressure. Bones cracked and snapped as they were broken from the pressure. The ball continued to get smaller, despite the shower of blood that violently sprayed out from it. It kept getting smaller and smaller, squishing what was left into a tiny ball, smaller than a marble. The energy had compressed the man's atoms together into an ultra-dense black stone. Nothing else was left of the Anbu. Save for the kunai and Hinata's eye and the blood that coated the entire clearing, Naruto could only smile to himself as darkness clouded his vision. His form slowly sank down, completely drained. The tiny amount of chakra left in him would keep him alive for little more than a few hours. At least Hinata's death has been avenged. It was then that he finally drifted into unconsciousness, oblivious to the world. Hello here. Phew, that was fun. I was thinking about continuing this chapter. But I decided I'd just post it and write another one later. I don't know how much time I'll have this week. Anyways, there are a couple of things I gotta go over before I post. It doesn't matter how much chakra you have, it only matters how much you can force through your chakra system. If a Janan was given the same amount of chakra that a cage had, it wouldn't allow him to do high level jutsu until his chakra pathways grew enough to accommodate the high flow of chakra needed. Naruto found a way around this by molding it outside his body. He is the only one able to do this because of his bloodline, so this technique would be useless for anyone else, and they'd just waste all that chakra. That's why Orochimaru's cursed seal needs a person to die. They are forced to regrow their chakra pathways to accommodate the incredible influx of chakra they receive from it. It's a decent explanation, I think. The only reason Naruto and Hinata have been doing so well against the sound ninja is because they made a great plan, caught them off guard had several hours to set traps beforehand, and didn't try to fight them, only distract them to get their comrades out of the enemy's clutches. If Naruto had stayed to fight, he would have died, even with his new technique to control his massive demon-sized chakra stored in the seal. Nature chakra is like the chakra of the planet. Human chakra is the chakra of a person. Mix the incredible energy of dead or non-living chakra with live or living chakra and that's what you'll get. In my story at least. It's nothing more than life force on steroids. The plants were drawn to it, and it helped them grow at the rapid rate they did. It only lasted till it was gone, but it still killed the man. No worries about him coming back anytime soon. I doubt his soul would even be able to reincarnate after that. The other Anbu. Naruto's chakra compressed the atoms of his body together to create the black stone. It took a lot of energy. Almost all nine tails worth Naruto could store. Before he was able to mold the chakra outside his body, he only had access to about one one hundredth of a tail of chakra. The chakra he could access was roughly equivalent to a low or mid-level Jounin. Yeah, he's got a lot more now. More than all of the kid just combined and doubled. Yep. It comes with a price though. Like I said, he can only draw so much chakra at the same time without killing plants or disrupting the planet's chakra. Sure, some plants dying isn't horrible, but if he disrupts the Earth's chakra, he could literally cause the world to become unstable. Basically, the end of the world. Yeah dangerous bloodline. I think Kami-sama would jump in before that happened though. You never know. So, because Naruto used up almost all of his chakra, 
It will be quite a long time at the rate it usually takes him to regain it all. About a year and a half. I've got another idea for it though, but you'll just have to wait. Chapter 9 To say that Kenmaru was pissed would be like saying Itachi liked Paki or Naruto thought ramen tasted okay. It was a massive understatement. Tujanan. All it took to completely stop the first wave of the sound's planned invasion was Tujanan. Otokage-sama will not be pleased he though to himself. Of the four Anbu, Ten Jounin, 15 Chounin, and 21 Jounin, their numbers had been reduced to 4 Jounin, 7 Chounin and 9 Jounin. All four Anbu had been wiped out by that. That. Thing. The strange phantasm that was apparently a member of the Jounin team supporting the border patrol had done most of the damage. How he did so was painfully obvious. First, he played off of our fears, what with the creepy fog and that strange shadow that surrounded him. That was almost as scary as Orochimaru-sama on a bad day. Next, he surprise attacked us with Cage Bunshine and those strange chakra attacks. Then, his teammate and him carried off our prisoners and lead us straight into a fuckload of traps. We didn't see them because we were so intent at perusing them. Then, the odd would disappeared as they were the only ones capable of following them. By the time the rest of us caught up to the battle site, one was paralyzed from a broken neck, and we never found the bodies of the other two. It appeared that the last Anbu was killed in the initial ambush. Damn it all, by the time we had arrived, they had vanished. Damn it. At this rate, we'll never finish reinforcing our position before the Konoha forces arrive. A rather long and colorful string of curses flowed out of the man's mouth. Under his orders, everyone who could make Iwa, Mizu, Gage, or Suna Bunshine were told to make as many as possible to speed up the process of building their outpost. It wasn't as far into the fire country as they'd hoped, but still. Now, if only the rice country's army would arrive. Then they'd be set. Naruto could feel each and every ache in his body. Pain flared up each time he was jolted, which was quite a lot. He opened his eyes, squinting from the light that shone into his eyes. His head was resting on the right shoulder of someone. The evening sun was shining in his eyes. Naruto raised his head and took a look around. Miho was carrying a still unconscious Hinata. Her face was turned away from Naruto, so he couldn't see her eye but she had bandages wrapped around her entire head. He was riding on Kagamaru's back. Some sort of solid bunshine, whether it was Cage or any of the others, Naruto couldn't tell, of both of the Chunin were carrying all the luggage that Naruto's clones were carrying before Naruto passed out and his clones dissipated. Naruto groaned at a particularly rough jolt as the pain lanced through his body. It was his overstrained chakra pathways that burned. Shit, this might take a while to heal. In the meantime, Naruto racked his memories in search of one little piece of information. Did my clones get to the other patrols or not? He continually searched over and over. Finally, it came to him. Only the two closest to their sector had been alerted, and had probably alerted the Hokage via messenger birds. The two Chunin stopped, setting down their passengers. With a nod, Miho took off to set traps so they could rest, while Kagamaru checked over the injured Janan. Naruto was doing okay, despite coming out of a ridiculously outmatched battle. His chakra pathways are badly burned, but they should recover. Hinata. It's just too sad. In a clan that values eyesight above all else, she had a high chance of losing her eye. I can't be sure yet, but. At best she'll have a blind spot right in front of her, even if it heals up. Well, unless Tsunade Haim herself came to heal her, but she hasn't been seen in years. Naruto groaned and tried to sit up, only to fail and lie back down. Water. Please. Kagamaru held the canteen over the boy's lips so he could slowly drink. After nearly draining the container, Naruto nodded slightly in thanks and drifted back into unconsciousness. Miho landed next to Kagamaru. How are they doing? Naruto will recover in about a month, and at least a week of that has to be in the hospital or his chakra pathways could be scarred permanently. Hinata. Well. She'll be lucky if she doesn't lose her eye, but even more so if she still has any decent sight out of it. In any case, She's gonna be nearly half-blind for the rest of her life. Miho seemed to wither, remembering her and Kagamaru's original team mate back when they were still on a Janan team. Flashback, warning, this flashback will make you cry. Don't read if you don't want to. Oh heyo, Miho-chan. Oh heyo, Kagamaru-kun. The other person just smirked. His pale eyes were obviously that of a Hayuga, but surprisingly, his hair was an almost exact copy of his pale eyes color, rare but not unheard of trait in the Hayuga family. He wore the typical black pants and pale creme-colored jacket that composed the Hyuga training outfit. His left arm and right leg were bandaged. The pack he wore was light, containing only the bare necessities. Ah, Kanji-sama is in a bad mood? Man, I knew you were good at the Hyuga Grimace no Jutsu, 
but to be able to maintain it 24-7 is nothing short of amazing. It's true that the Hyuga are really great, aren't they, Miho-chan? Miho giggled of course. At least he isn't doing his signature move, the Hyuga monologue no jutsu. That one is truly scary. The two burst out laughing while Kenji just sat there, leaning against the building he was standing by, his face completely emotionless. Apparently the Uchiha and Hyuga had something in common other than black hair, a dujutsu, and sticks up their asses. They also had that annoying emotionless face that was either annoyed, apathetic, or in an arrogant smirk. It must be true that they were related. So, you guys ready for the second exam? The Jounin that had landed near the three Jinan was very typical. He wore the standard Jounin uniform, and wore his forehead protector on, so uniquely, sarcasm, on his forehead. Daisuke Sensei, you're the one who trained us. You of all people should know we're gonna kick everyone's asses. An exited Kagamaru nearly shouted. He did shout and carry on when their team was first formed, but they had broken him of that particular habit. It's a shame that the Hyuga was too far gone. Oh well. Well then, it's almost 9 o'clock, so get going. Eight hours later, Kagamaru was lying on the ground, his body partially covering Miho's. Kenji stood in the typical Jukan stance, Byakugan activated, staring at the three rock nids that were facing him. Give up your scroll and we'll leave. After we have our fun with the girl. Shut up, you fucking bastard. Miracle upon miracles, Kenji spoke. It's ninja like you that give us a bad name. Why don't you just run along and play with that microscopic thing you call genitals in the bushes? Why you little? The three attacked. Each and every attack was blocked by the Hyuga, and several quite deadly counter-attacks were flung back at them. Two were down, but the team captain was still standing. He pulled out a kunai and attacked. Slash after slack was dodged. For nearly five straight minutes this went on, until finally Kenji was off balance. He was in a position that he couldn't correct and would either have to fall, making him an easy target, or completely stop to correct himself, which would make it easier to attack him. The Rock Nin's attack had just slashed diagonally down to his left. With a sudden reversal, the knife flipped from a reverse hold to a traditional hold. Before anyone could do anything, the backslash sliced clean across the Hyuga's face. Blood flew through the air in little droplets, almost a mist as the Hyuga's right eye was sliced completely through. The ninja pulled his arm back and plunged his kunai deep into the Hyuga's chest. Hyuga Kenji, one of the more talented of the branch members, was dying. The rock nin spat on the Hyuga's now prone form. Pathetic. Wasn't even worth my time. Rage overcame Kagamaru. Despite the kunai in his leg that made him wince in pain when he stood, it didn't stop him from activating the most powerful jutsu he knew. Katan, Gukaku no jutsu. The fireball caught the rock nin off guard. His screams of pain could be heard throughout the forest of death. Kenji was barely alive. His blood was slowly seeping out of the hole in his chest, and it coated his lips, running down the side of his face. It flowed freely from the gash in his pulverized eye. He coughed, tasting the metallic tang of his own blood, spitting it out as best as he could. Kagamaru was kneeling over him trying to reassure the dying Hyuga. It's gonna be okay, Kenji. We'll get out of this. Don't die on me. Where? Cough are your insults cough now? Dobe, damn it, don't die on me. You are rookie of the year, you can't die. Hyuga are supposed to be invincible. I swear if you die on me I'll pull you back from the afterlife and kill you myself. Cough cough cough. Will you do? One last thing, cough. For me, Kagamaru. Yeah, I'll do it. Just don't die on me. Kenji reached his hand up and grasped Kagamaru's. He pulled out a kunai and slit both his own palm and his friends, grasping his hand. He let their blood mix. When I die. Tell my cough family. The color, cough. Of my eyes, cough brother. With one final fit of coughing, Hyuga Kenji, top of his graduating class, smiled. Not a smirk, not a grimace, but a true and genuine smile. His eyes closed for the last time, and for the first and last time, Kagemaru saw tears slide down his friend. No, his brother's face. His own tears were dripping off his chin and onto the dead boy's almost peaceful face. With one finger, he lifted the eyelid of his friends on Mardai. He was staring into a lifeless golden brown, a far cry from the pale lavender he was used to seeing. Slowly, he closed the eye again before crawling over to the unconscious form of his other teammate and sobbing himself to sleep. And flashback, okay, it's safe to continue reading now. Before either of them could react, a large group of medic nin and two Anbu squads jumped into the clearing. They tensed up for a moment before recognizing the leaf emblem all over their various items. One Anbu approached them and said report. They explained the situation to them while the medics patched up a still unconscious Naruto, Hinata, Iviki, and Kuji. 
they loaded them onto stretchers and jumped into the treetops, making as much haste as possible to get them back to the Konoha General Hospital. I see. You are ordered to return to Konoha and await further orders from the Hokage. Hi. The two Chunin took off, passing another two squads of Konoha Anbu as they met up with the others. They followed after the medic nins, anxious to see Team 7's fate. Naruto woke up to an annoying beep. It kept beeping and beeping. His eyes were attempting to adjust to the darkness while he reached over to where his alarm clock should be, trying to turn it off. His hand only hit air. Looking over, he saw wires and tubes coming off his body, and a heartbeat monitor. So that's the beeping I hear. Feeling too tired to try to stand, but too awake to go back to sleep, he drew out a little chakra from his surroundings, testing his chakra pathways. They were still stinging in a couple of places, like his palms, but for the most part were in working order. They were much larger than before, but they still worked. Dropping into a trance, Naruto extended his awareness, slowly building links to his body, a trickle of chakra coming from each link into his seal, keeping him alive. Slowly, it would fill, but at this rate, it would take a very long time. Not in days, or weeks, but more in months. Around 16 at this rate, and that's if he didn't use any between then and now. He sighed and drifted off to sleep. The last thought that ran through his head before he finally fell into its kind embrace was I wonder if Hinata is okay. Naruto finally woke then next morning, the doctor came in and gave him a checkup. The doctor was at first puzzled as to why Naruto had no chakra, but Naruto explained to him about his bloodline and the empty, or nearly empty anyway, seal. The doctor was rather surprised, but eventually released him from the hospital on strict orders of bed rest for the next week and a half. No training. No chakra molding if at all possible, just the life of a civilian until his chakra pathways had sealed and he has a decent amount of chakra stored up again. So, naturally, the first thing Naruto did is. If you thought training you're wrong. He went to see his teammates. Sighing, Naruto slowly and quietly pushed open the door to Aviki sensei's room. His Jounin instructor, although rather intimidating and very verbally abusive, had grown on the three, and Naruto wouldn't trade him for the world. He found him to be. Surprisingly, awake. Iviki sensei, how are you doing? Oh, I'm still rather sore, Naruto. The knockout poison they gave me wasn't really that potent, but it turns out that I'm allergic to it. So, my chakra is messed up for the next week or so. I'm stuck in bed till the day after tomorrow at least. At least you're alive. I'm glad. Iviki smiled, something he really only did since accepting this Shinan team. It's good to know someone cares. Iviki sensei, do you have? Any family? Iviki smiled sadly. Not really. My parents were killed when I was a Jinan. My brother ran away from Konoha and became a messenger, and my wife. Here, he paused. The most feared man in Konoha was on the verge of crying. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to pry. No, no, it's perfectly okay. I'm glad to know that at least three people accepted me for me. Not for my title. Being chief interrogator and captain of the torture and interrogation squad gives you a nasty reputation. I'm more than glad I gave that position to Onko. She's even better than I was. Silence slowly fell in the room. For a half of an hour, they sat in silence, just enjoying each other's company. Finally, Naruto spoke up. Iviki sensei I'm going to go check on Kuji and Hinata. I hope you get well. I'd bring you some flowers, but something tells me that's not your style. Iviki chuckled. Naruto stood and walked out of the room. Slowly, he wandered the halls, finding his way to Kuji's room. He slowly opened the door, again not wanting to wake his teammate as he is sleeping. Kuji was still asleep. True, Naruto didn't get a good look at him while he and his clones were moving him from the ambush spot. But now, it was painfully obvious that Kuji had fought the group with Iviki. Almost all of Kuji's fat had disappeared and his well-toned muscles stood out underneath his skin. Naruto smiled knowingly at the flowers and get well cards that were marked as being from Shikamaru and Ino, and a large basket of junk foods from his family. Naruto smiled at the barbecue pork-flavored chips that made up of most of the basket, knowing that was his favorite. I'm definitely gonna have to take him out to barbecue when he's out of the hospital. He'll enjoy that. Naruto again stood up after spending a few moments with his teammate. No, his friend. He walked towards his final destination for the day, hoping and praying that she was okay. Flashback. Hinata looked up at Naruto's face as he crouched over her. She could only see half of what she usually could. A strange calm came over her. Her voice was racked with pain. She shuddered and reached out a hand, cupping Naruto's masked face. Naruto-kun, Ashitaru. Her body went limp. Naruto grabbed her hand and held it to his face. His tears were soaking the front of his mask, 
but he didn't care. He could only watch as his closest friend died in his arms. And flashback. Did she really mean it? Did she really love me? I know she liked me, and I know she had a major crush on me. But, was it truly love? And why do I feel like I do when I think about her? What do I feel for her? What do I truly want from her? Friendship or love? Naruto continued to ponder this as he slowly approached Hinata's room. However, just before he entered it, a doctor stopped him. Hayuga-san, Hinata-san is awake. But, I'm not sure if you want to see her. She, is rather depressed. I don't know how she'll handle visitors. Sir, she is my teammate, and more so, she's my friend. She needs me and I'll be damned to the seventh layer of hell before I leave a friend in need. The doctor recoiled at the killer intent and incredible intensity Naruto spoke those words with. He slowly nodded, lowering his head in defeat. Naruto slid open the door so see Hinata sitting up in bed, her head hanging down, bandages covering nearly half her head. It was painfully obvious from the dampness of the bandages and blankets and from the swelling around her eyes that she had been crying for quite a while. Hinata-chan. She looked up as Naruto walked over to sit in a chair next to her and sat down. She looked at him for a moment before looking away. He'll never accept me now. If I couldn't get him before now, then I sure as hell can't get him now that I'm, disfigured. She burst into another wave of silent tears. This did not slip past Naruto. He leaned in and gave her a warm, comforting hug. Hinata-chan, Naruto-kun. What, what will father say? Aiko, could barely pa, pass his tests be, before. But now, Hinata leaned into the hug Naruto had not broken, crying into his shoulder. He just sat there and held her, not quite sure of what to do. So he did what just felt natural to him. He softly patted her back, trying to comfort her while whispering to her, It'll all be okay. I won't abandon you. Trust me. And if Hyashi-sama tries to do anything about a wound you honorably received in battle, I'll shove his marriage bed so far up his ass that he'll never find it again. It's okay. Just let it all out. Hinata cried for another couple of minutes before finally sitting back, only hiccuping every few minutes or so. I wish. I wish there was something more I could do for you. Hinata. If there is anything you want me to do for you, just ask. I'll do anything so see you smile again. Hinata's eye widened at this statement. No, this promise. She thought back to what she said just before she passed out. I have to ask him. Kami-sama, if you have wished good fortune on me. Please let me have the courage to tell him, Naruto. I need to know. She paused. Her unbandaged pale lavender eye looked deeply into his. Naruto could see the pain and the yearning in them. Naruto. I need to know. How do you feel about me? Will. Will you ever love me, or? Are we forever fated to remain, just fiends? Hinata. Everything that had happened in the past few days rushed through his mind. He felt the anger, the rage. He felt how much he wanted to protect Konoha, his team and. Hinata. And when he was passing out, he remembered. He remembered how angry he felt that she had died, and when he had killed her attackers, he remember feeling. It was something he couldn't describe. It was something like his desire to protect her. But. Also. It was more. A longing to make her happy, a need to make her smile, even if it cost him his own life. There was only one word he had ever heard that could describe something like this. Love. Hinata, I would go to the darkest pits of seven hells and back again to see you smile. All I ask is that you never leave me again, he nodded his eye widened. Despite her pain, her feelings of inadequacy, despite the fact that she only had one working eye and would be scarred for life, she felt pure, untainted joy well up inside of her. The tight yet gentle embrace Naruto pulled her into after that nearly brought tears to her eyes. She hugged him back, and although they were gently, they could feel the pressure of each other. Hinata was on cloud nine. It didn't matter that the tears were stinging her bandaged eye. It didn't matter that the doctor was watching them this whole time, and it certainly didn't matter that she caught a glimpse of her father standing in the doorway, one of his few genuine smiles playing on his lips before he slowly and quietly closed the door. Naruto. I've never been good with words. I can barely. Make two sentences. Without stuttering. But. If I could say it in any way that truly described how I felt about you, I would, but in the end. The truth of it is. I love you, Hayuga Naruto. I wouldn't leave you for the world. Naruto felt. Warm. Her heartbeat could be felt even through his thick jacket. It thumped in time with the beeping of the machine. Naruto, unable to find words for what he wanted to say, broke the embrace. Hinata took this as a sign of rejection, and immediately she dropped her head, letting her posture sink into a dejected husk of what she was just a moment before. She didn't even register the fingers she felt under her chin, and didn't seem to notice Naruto lifting her head. 
What finally brought her out of this fall was when she felt something on her lips. Hinata's mind went completely blank when she felt Naruto's lips on hers. The action she had been dreaming about for as long as she could remember had happened, and the only thing she could do was freeze up. Finally, when her mind had caught up, she let her arms wrap around her love, gentle yet assuring. Newfound confidence flowed through her and she leaned into him as best as she could from her semi-prone position. After a minute or two, they split and stared into each other's eyes. Their hands found each other's and their fingers interlaced. Naruto scooted his chair up closer to the bed. He rested his head against the pillow Hinata was laying on as she scooted down to get more comfortable. They lay there, in complete silence, completely contented with just each other's presence. The small squeezes they gave each other's hand and the snuggling on the pillow was enough for each of them. Slowly, yet inexorably, Hinata drifted into a deep, peaceful slumber. Naruto watched his newly proclaimed love. The happiness, despite the inescapable war waiting on the horizon, overflowed. It wasn't the plastic mask he had donned each day as a child, nor was it the contentedness he displayed at the Hyuga house. This was a true feeling of unconditional love. Love without bounds, willing to do anything for her. Slowly, Naruto started to succumb to sleep, his mind replaying yet again what had happened at the battle site. Suddenly, without warning, he sat up straight. Replaying the memory of the Anbu he killed with his Amatsu Tenshi no Senshu Haki, Hayakanayu Hachiya, he saw the plants literally grow instantly. A blast of inspiration flooded him. He quietly stood and left to find Hinata's doctor. After half an hour of searching, he brought the rather confused medical professional to Hinata's room. Sir, I think I know a jutsu that can save her eye. I don't know exactly how it will affect her. I know that it will cause the cells in her eye to rapidly reproduce. I need to know. If I do this, can you limit and control the growth so that her eye heals properly? The doctor thought for a moment, playing any and all possible scenario in his mind. If what he says is true, then, yes, it's possible. However, if it gets out of control, there may be uncontrollable and irreversible side effects. Hyuga-san, how exactly do you expect this jutsu to work? Naruto explained to the man about the juiced up life force he can create. The doctor thought for a moment before finally saying I believe it's possible. However I want at least four other doctors here for the operation, and I want Hinata-sama and her father's consent before we do anything. If there is even a 25% chance of this working, you have my consent as long as Hinata agrees. Hyashi-sama. Both Naruto and the doctor said in unison. What? What's going on? Hinata sat up, and her hand halfway to her head from rubbing her eye. Naruto, yet again, explained the situation. Hinata, it's possible that you could completely lose your eye if this fails. As of now, you will only have partial vision. Do you want to go through with this? Hinata sat there, mentally debating. She seemed to be wavering in the middle. After a moment, she managed to finally give her answer. You, have my consent. Then it's settled. The doctor said, before running off to get the most skilled doctors in Konoha. Half an hour later, they were in a prepared operating room. The five doctors and Naruto stood around Hinata's unconscious form. Naruto was out of his training outfit and into a doctor's uniform. All the medical professionals around him nodded, and Naruto pulled out some chakra from one of the nurses who volunteered for the honor, and mixed it with a fair amount of nature chakra. Naruto experimented with a mix, slowly balancing it into a mixture only twice as strong as normal life force instead of the insane 500 times as strong life force created in the woods. Slowly, he lowered his glowing white hand over Hinata's eye. Chapter 10 Naruto concentrated as best he could. Slowly gathering the modified life force, he slowly let it leak into Hinata's wound or die. All five of the doctors watched in amazement as the cells started multiplying before their eyes. Something was off. All the cells were multiplying, whether or not they were the ones needed or not. Carefully, the doctors cut away and incinerated the extra cells not needed with their chakra scalpels as the eye slowly repaired itself, knitting together like a complete reversal of the wound. Sweat started running down their foreheads, and the nurses carefully wiped it away making sure none dripped into the wound or onto the unconscious girl. Naruto ignored the doctors as they calmly gave instructions to each other and to the nurses. Naruto just stood there and slowly leaked the life force into her eye, letting the doctor shape and mold the eye back to its former glory. Minutes turned into hours as the time wore on. Despite being naturally adept with chakra and having near-perfect control, Naruto was getting tired. The doctors were much worse off, and had to eat several soldier pills just to keep going. Finally. One of the doctors spoke up. Naruto-san, it's done, you can stop now. H, hi. Naruto sat down, profusely thanking the nurse who brought him a glass of cold water. He watched as all five of the doctors scan Hinata's entire body, looking for any adverse side effects, 
and comparing her newly healed eye with her undamaged one. Slowly, Naruto's eyelids grew heavier and heavier. His eyes drooped, and soon he lost the fight against sleep. With a start, Naruto jumped up, looking around frantically. He was standing next to Hinata's bed, back into the room he visited her in. Naruto smiled and calmed himself down. He sat back down and reached his hand out to lovingly caress her cheek, feeling how smooth her skin was. She smiled in her sleep and rolled over, trapping his hand between her head and the pillow. Her hands unconsciously reached up and grabbed his, holding it closer to her. Naruto fell to tugging at his chest, much like he felt when he saw her die, but this time it was. Happy. A feeling of bliss, just a few steps beneath the euphoria or nirvana, invaded his emotions, throwing all the others to the back of his mind. He reveled in it. He made himself comfortable on the chair, leaning his head back against the back of it. Slowly, sleep made its inexorable march, forcing him to move on to his dreams, all centered on his lavender-eyed love. Slowly, oh so slowly, things began to return to normalcy. He not his eye, with a few following checkups, had returned to normal. Due to the kunai piercing her pupil, it was now somewhat slitted, something like a mix between the snakes and a cat's. It was just a slightly deeper shade of the pale lavender that made up her usual eye, and was barely noticeable at all. With a fair amount of training, she managed to bring its usefulness up from the initial 50% capacity it was initially at directly after the surgery to its full 100% capacity. Her Byakugan, before the incident, was still not fully formed. She could only see the outlines of the internal chakra systems, and only the largest third of the Tenkatsu, only enough to use the Haki Rakuhuyanchao. However, because of her intense and constant training, she had, much like her cousin Neji had done at the age of 10, awakened her bloodline to its fullest potential. The only real difference was the ability to better see the chakra pathways, all the tenketsu, and doubling the maximum range she could see around her. The last part could be trained even farther, but it would take time. As for Hinata's bold proclamation of her love to Naruto as she lay dying, and Naruto's reaction to her death, after Hinata had been released from the hospital, she'd confessed to him, and he to her that could be seen on most evenings in some highly recommended restaurants by the Akimichi clan, cinema, and several other places that most people go for entertainments. Or dates. The farthest they've ever gotten, though, was some rather intimate kissing and hugging, not having the courage to go farther than that. All in all, the two were in bliss. As for the war between rice and fire countries, it was an obvious routing. Without the element of surprise and the full support of every single ninja in Konoha, the sound village withdrew its support. The rice country's armies were utterly defeated by the much larger fire country's numerical and strategic might. In short terms, rice and sound got their asses handed to them because a fusion on got away from some of their most powerful ninja. The mission offers to sound was drastically reduced, and their participation in the upcoming Chunin exams was their only chance to regain the respect as good fighters, but only if one of their Xinan won the tournament. Speaking of the Chunin exams, although it was Konoha's turn to host the event, they utterly refused to allow Sound Nin into their village. Therefore, the rest of the hidden villages held a meeting and decided that it was to be hosted in Kirigakur no Sato. The Mizukage was more than willing to host the event, and declared that any unsanctioned fighting between any shinobi of different villages would get their entire village banned from the event. All the cage accepted the terms with varying degrees of enthusiasm. Because of the delay in organizing the event, the date that it would start was pushed back almost two months. Our team was, at this moment, sitting under a cool tree, studying a few scrolls they'd picked up here and there. Kuji was studying a jutsu scroll given him directly by the Sanin Jiraiya, who was rather impressed at his skill with jutsu. Hinata was studying a medical scroll that was written by the legendary Kunoichi of Konoha, the Sanin Tsunade herself. It was, however, only on loan from the Hokage. Nardo. He was actually studying a book of unknown origins. He didn't know where it had come from, how it had got there, or who had given it to him. Apparently, it was a book on Taijutsu. It outlined many different forms and kata from a style that not even Maito Guy had heard of. Tai Chi. What really intrigued the boy was that he saw a lot of potential in this style. He could, theoretically, use raw chakra blasts in nearly every single blow the style showed him. It was as if this style was made just for that purpose. But he just continued to study, deciding to learn all the theoretical sides behind the style, which were many before he actually practiced it. He had already learned some of the most basic kata, and was doing well. He had even shown the book to Guy, who had in turn helped the boy correct his stance so that the moves flowed properly. In return, Guy got to learn a new style just for helping the boy out. It was a mutually beneficial relationship. Things were progressing well for this team, 
and they had all been given a month's worth of vacation along with the pay for an S-class mission. To top it all off, they had all received the Golden Kunai, a very prestigious award for valor in the midst of combat. They were, to date, the youngest ninja to ever receive this award, and that included its equivalents from the other villages as well. Flashback Sondaime Hokage stood in front of a pedestal, looking at the assembled ranks of shinobi in front of them, and the crowd of civilians behind them. He cleared his voice before starting his speech. I have called this meeting today to dispel a few rumors. Many of you have heard about the recent incident on the Fire Rice border. Yes, it is true that Rice Country and Odogaku are attacked in tandem, intending to invade Fire Country and, eventually, crush Konoha. The area they invaded was currently being patrolled by an undermanned Chunin team. One of their teammates had been injured and extracted to Konoha General Hospital for treatment. In order to enhance our defenses, I ordered the Jinan team that had escorted the medic Nin to the rendezvous to become a replacement on the team for the out-of-action Chunin. Fortunately for us, that was the best thing that could have happened under the circumstances. Team 7, the first of our experimentally trained Jinan teams, lead by Tokubitsu Jan and Morino Iviki, and displayed fine teamwork in the face of great adversity. The attacking force, while currently estimated at one Anbu team, around 10 Jounin, nearly a score of Chunin, and three dozen Jinan was the spearheading force in the invasion. In a surprise attack, the spearheading force knocked out and captured both Morino Iviki and Akimichi Kuji. The two fought well, injuring and incapacitating at least ten of the sound men. After learning that their companions had been captured, Hayuga Hinata and Hayuga Naruto ambushed said group, rescued their friends, and nearly have the remaining shinobi through well-set traps and genjutsu, as well as killing three Anbu. They also managed to alert other border patrols and their two Chinese teammates. However, they did not come out without injury. Iviki and Kuji were near death, Hinata had a kunai impaled in her eye and Naruto had chakra burns throughout most of his system and was suffering from severe chakra depletion. Thankfully, all four are almost fully recovered. Kuji and Hinata are still in physical therapy, Kuji for his massive weight loss and muscle depletion, and Hinata for relearning how to use her recently healed eye. He paused for a moment before continuing. In light of these feats, I would like to bestow upon all members of Team 7 the Red Moon, signifying injuries received in combat. His attendants walked forwards and handed each person a polished wooden box. Also, because of their valor and the role they played in defending our country, I would like to bestow upon them the golden kunai. An exited murmur swept through the crowd as each member of the team received another wooden box. I realize that these three Jinan are the youngest to ever receive such a large honor in the history of all shinobi villages. Their actions have brought both their families and their village honor. Because of this, we should honor them in turn. Thank you. The San Daime stepped down from the pedestal smiling warm-heartedly as the crowd went wild, celebrating Konoha's newest heroes. And flashback. By now, most of the village saw the three in a new light. Hinata was no longer seen as the barely passable Hyuga heir, and Kuji as the shy Akimichi heir, but as fine shinobi, and heroes even. As for Naruto, by now most everyone knew he was the Yondaime's son, had a unique Byakugan-esque bloodline, and was supposed to be the vessel for the Kyubi no Kitsune. Before, he was seen in a mixed light. Some had still hated him, thinking he was Kyuubi's reincarnation, while others thought neutrally of him. Now, after receiving such praise for his actions during the invasion, he was considered one of Konoha's greatest heroes, as well as one of their greatest prodigies. Needless to say, his already sizable fan club swelled to record numbers, becoming larger than both Neji and Sasuke's combined, but still couldn't match Uchiha Itachi's former fan club. It was now disbanded, but its legacy lives on. In any case, it was much more difficult to get from one point to the next because of the hordes of screaming girls and women. Neji seethed in jealousy as he saw his cousin sitting under a tree, comfortable in the presence of her teammates. Not only did she have better teamwork than his own team, but her Byakugan had somehow developed equal and possibly even surpassing his. Also, she had received honors because, in his mind at least, she was from the main house. He failed to see that her two teammates had received the same award. His hatred of the main house had dimmed slightly because of Naruto's presence in the Hyuga household, it had risen again twofold. At least I may have a chance to get my revenge in the Chunin exams. Guy sensei told us that we'd be participating this year, and I'm certain that her team will be there as well. He smirked darkly to himself, fantasizing about the pain he would deal out to her. His mind snapped back into reality when he heard someone call his name. Oi, Neji-san, what's so funny? Inwardly he seethed, but his only visible emotion was that of apathy. Nothing, Naruto-sama. I was sent to retrieve you and Hinata-sama. You are being summoned by Hayuga-sama. Naruto and Hinata stood up, nodded to Neji, 
and bid farewell to Kuji. After a nice soothing run across the rooftops, they arrived at the compound, and made their way to Hyashi's personal meditation garden, as instructed. They arrived to see the head of the Hyuga clan, wonder upon all wonders, note heavy sarcasm, meditating, ah, Hinata, Naruto, come over here please, hi they said in unison. They sat down in front of the emotionless man. He opened his eyes and looked at them intently. It has come to my attention that, after Hinata had gotten out of the hospital, you two have been seen in various restaurants, cinemas, and other places. You were seen holding hands, intimately touching, and kissing by several branch members. In public, no less. The two cringed. It was, surprisingly, Hinata that spoke up first. Father, in all due respect. I will continue to see Naruto-kun. Hyashi's eyebrows raised in surprise at her determination. I love him, and I won't let you separate us. He is the only person I will ever consent to marry and you can either accept that fact or you can find another heir. Hinata's voice, although quiet throughout her small speech, carried a large amount of emotion and confidence in them. Hyashi smiled. Naruto truly is bringing out the best in her. And this just makes this easier. Hinata, I realize your attachment to Naruto, but it can't be helped. The council has already had a marriage arranged for you since you were six years old. There is nothing you can do except to accept your fate. He raised a palm to stop both of their protests before they even started. The two only glared at him. In order to maintain the clan's honorable name, on the eve of your 16th birthday, you will be wedded, in order to bring a strong man and an equally strong bloodline into the Hyuga clan, but father slash Hyashi-sama. Their protests were cut off again. Hyashi was trying his best to not break out laughing, seeing as they two had no idea what was in store for him. Looks like I have the last laugh for all those pranks, eh Naruto? He thought, in order to fully accept your marriage, you are to get to know your betrothed from now until you are wed. If you refuse, you will be stripped of your title and you will be branded with a caged bird seal and placed in the branch family, and you will be forced to marry anyway. Hinata seemed to deflate at this news, while Naruto was both shocked and angry. His knuckles were white, his muscles tensing and relaxing, trying his best not to attack the Hyuga head. Hinata, you must accept your betrothed. It is what is best for you. He trailed off as Hinata's deer streaked gaze met his. She was meek and humble once again. Who have I been betrothed to, father? Her voice was emotionless, yet cold, carrying no feeling whatsoever. Hyashi's laughter that had been welling up died instantly, and his eyes moistened at the sight of his defeated daughter. Your betrothed is the son of a cage and a very accomplished ninja. His name once was Uzumaki, but he was adopted into the Hyuga clan. Hinata, your betrothed is Hyuga Naruto. They two were speechless. They could only gape their gazes switching back and forth between Hyashi and their future spouse. Hyashi smiled and grabbed one of each of their hands. I know it's unexpected, but I approve of your relationship. A few ground rules. Both you and Naruto are to be virgins of every sense of the matter until your marriage night. I forbid you to go any farther than kissing. Also, you two will remain fully clothed whenever in the same room, with the exception of hot springs and communal baths. When sleeping in the same room, pajamas will be worn at all times. Other than that, you are free to tell anyone you choose about your engagement. I expect you to continue your good behavior during missions and to continue training. Now, if I hear of any of these rules broken, the betrothal will be broken and you two will never be married. Is that clear? Despite his stern tone, the two were grinning broadly and nodding. With that, he placed Hinata's hand in Naruto's. They stood and he embraced the two in a warm, fatherly hug. The rest of the day was a haze for the two stunned teenagers. The only thing they could think of at the time was we are really getting married. The next morning, Hinata woke early. As she looked at herself in the mirror, she remembered what had happened yesterday. Deciding that a relaxing morning bath was in order, due to the fact they didn't have training scheduled for today, Hinata grabbed a change of cloths, wrapped herself in a robe, and made her way to the bathhouse. Just as she was about to enter, she heard Oi, Hinata-chan, wait up, N, Naruto-kun, hi. Thanks for waiting. Let's go in, shall we? H. Hi. Both Hinata and Naruto blushed before they entered their respective genders changing rooms. After a quick scrubbing, they made their way to the central pool, the only one in the complex with mixed bathing. The couple found each other quickly, but the steam was quite thick and hard to see through. Blushing, they sat on opposite sides of a rock that jutted out from the very middle of the pool. Their hands snaked around either side and they laced fingers, comforted by each other's touch. They sat in silence for a few moments. Naruto, deciding to start up a conversation, said so. I guess we're going to be married in a few years. Hi, so. What do you want to do? I, I was thinking we should. We should train. 
I want to look at in the clan library, would you mind? Tagging along? N. No problem, Hina-chan. Hinata blushed, unseen by anyone, before squeezing Naruto's hand while saying thank you, Naru-chan. Naruto blushed as well, but the steam in the bathhouse was indeed very thick. It went unseen. Slowly, as they started to get lightheaded from the heat, they made their ways back to their changing rooms, and got dressed. Meeting just outside the entrance, Naruto enveloped her into a loving embrace. Hinata smiled and hugged back. She didn't expect him to pull back and plant his lips on hers, but... Indeed he did so. She was surprised at first, but gradually melted into his arms, returning the loving and passionate kiss with equal enthusiasm. Their tongue battle was halted abruptly by someone clearing their throat. They looked around embarrassed, their cheeks tinted red. If you two are done cleaning each other's teeth, would you kindly let me by? I believe that this bathhouse may be used by any Hyuga, not just you two, said a cold, hate-filled voice. Neji Nisan, go I. Sorry, Neji San. They parted and let the Hyuga prodigy through. Naruto grinned before saying come on, Hina-chan. Let's get to the library, Ni. H. Hi. That's the end guys if you enjoyed then make sure to leave a comment this is Chaos Shinobi signing off.